בי בעזרת השם לשידוך הגון לשירה בת שרה, אין ברכה בת שרה, אוסו לעילוי נשמת אלי מלך בן מרדכי, לרפואת אדליה חגילו בת רחל, אין לרפואת אברהם בן טובה. ברוך השם, every day something new, as we, as we speak, I saw a message that uh, there's a major uh, cyber attack on Israel now. So you cannot call the emergency authorities, not ambulance, police, serious. These Iranians, they're not dumb. They're very advanced. They're very evil and they're very smart. Hamas is very evil, but very stupid. But once they got together with Iran, they became malicious and smart. The Iranians actually instructs them what to do, what not to do. That's the, the problem became 10 times worse. Of course, we as people who knows there is a God and there is a Torah and there is Ashgacha, there's a supervision of Hashem on every detail in the creation for Jews, for non-Jews, for the good people, for the bad people. The one who watches everyone is Hashem. And no one, no one can even have an itch on his head unless Hashem approved it. You should know that. Most people in today's generation, they lived in a complete darkness, spiritual darkness. I mean, they may know a lot about a lot of other things around them in the world, they're very aware, but when it comes to the most important thing in life, most people, Jews and non-Jews, have no understanding whatsoever what this world is about. They don't understand. Most people, I would assume, from experience of 30 years, most people believe in God. Not most, all. All people believe in God. Even those who claim I'm an atheist, they're all lying. For a very simple reason, which I said it before in the lectures, if you come to any person in the world, anyone, and tell them, do you believe that this plastic cup with all the parallel lines and the round shape this plastic cup that worth one cent, do you believe that it was made by itself? They would laugh at you. <laughs> You're normal. <laughs> How can it be made by itself? Some factory made it. Someone designed it. Someone decided that that will be the size of the cup and that will be the shape of it. And there are written uh, words in the, in the bottom of it, meaning someone designed this whole thing, even though it's a very simple thing. There is not one person in the world that will say that this was made by itself, by some random explosion. And if there will be a person like this, we will all know to stay away from him because it's obviously not normal. So far, everyone agree? Now, what is most sophisticated? This one penny right here in my hand or a brain of a human being with 10 trillion connection? If you take all the satellites in the world, all the landline, all the internet lines, all the cell phone lines, all over the world, combine as not one percent of a brain of one person alone, one person. 10 trillion connections. The whole world have eight billion people. Some of them have phones, some of them don't. Overall, maximum lines that you can have, it's 8 billion. It's nothing compared to 10 trillion. 10 trillion is 10 billion multiplied by 1,000. Do you understand what we're saying here? It's not even 1% of a brain of one person. One person multiplied by 8 billion people. Imagine how many brains are functioning in the world. And the brain is 80% gel. It's the size of an apple. Take 80% of the apple, it leaves you one little tiny piece. That's really what the human being is all about. A little tiny thing, very small, because 80% is water. And inside this gel water, there are 10 trillion wires and connections and the size of each wire 
is one thousandth of the thickness of the hair. Meaning if you pull out one hair from your head, one hair, take one thousand wires from your brain, attach them together, they will be the size of one hair. One hair, it's thick like a thousand wires from your brain. And inside that very, very thin wires who are covered with water and gel, who are covered with protection, meaning a bone that covers the brain. Inside those wires, you have blood circulations. Tiny, milli, 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 million of a liter moving to all 10 trillion connection. And if one wire will be clogged, that's already either a person died or fall into coma or become paralyzed, one of the three. One wire out of 10 trillion, and that's functioning for 80, 90, or 100 years, recording everything, understanding everything, activating the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, thousands of different flavors, millions of different colors, trillions of images. Just here, sitting here tonight, if I will hypnotize you after the lecture and I will ask you about every detail in this room. You will be able to describe to me in a period of 10 years. 10 years it will take you and you will not finish to describe this room. 10 years. Because the brain now recording every book, every basket, every piece of the chandelier, the microphone, this bottle of water, the pictures, the, the clock, every little detail here on the rug, every stain, your brain and the eyes are constantly recording everything. If I will ask you now, can you describe to me the rug on the, in the synagogue? <laughs> you say, oh, the rug? I didn't even look at the rug, I, don't even, I can't even tell you what color it is. If I ask you after the lecture outside, can you describe to me the rug in the synagogue? I don't know, I don't remember. Brown, black, what, what color it was? How come? You sit here for two hours and you don't see the color of the rug? No, I didn't pay attention to the rug. I pay attention to you. But if I hypnotize you, you will tell me every dot on the rug. Every little thing that fell on the rug. Every scratch on the wood. Every chair that is crooked. Everything you will be able to tell me. This is how brilliant is the brain together with the eyes, with the ear, everything is being recorded. Every second of your life, trillions, not billions, trillions of details are recorded in the brain of every individual for a period of 80, 90 years that is alive, but not only from this life, it's also from your past life. Meaning if we hypnotize you, and you'll be able, once you're in a trance, we're getting into your soul and retrieving information from your soul. Every detail, every detail that it's completely minor, you'll be able to tell. Every noise you heard, every phone that rang, every person who made any noise in the middle of the lecture, you can tell me exactly where it was, who it was, even a year later. I can, I can hypnotize you here at the end of 2024, about tonight. And we will regress you to the moment of tonight. And you will be able to tell me every book, every little dirt, everything that happens in this room. But I can also take you back 50 years ago, before you were born. And you, we will find out that you were in your past life, maybe in France, maybe in England, maybe in Germany, maybe in Iraq. We will find out your past life. You will give us information in a different language that right now you don't even know. And we will show you a video, I speak Arabic, or Farsi, or French. And you say, what am I saying? So this is who you used to be in your past life. And we can get all the details from your past life. We can go to August 10, uh, 1965. And you say, what's your name, Henry? Where you live in Paris? What's your job? I'm a tailor. Where are you going right now? I'm going to pray Mincha in a synagogue. Where is the synagogue? He will tell you the street. It's all in French. Then we bring him back to conscious. We we'll show him the video. So, well, what, what is this? How can I speak French? I don't know one word in French. This is your past life. 
and then we can take you to the life before. Why am I telling you all of this? Today, someone sent me a video. It's a modern Orthodox person in Israel who his wife went through treatment, IVF, I believe, to conceive, to have kids. And they had a triplet. Triplet. Two boys and a girl. They are very young, two years old now, two years old. Two years ago, she gave birth. I don't know if you remember, about 15 years ago, the Hamas, Imach Shimam, kidnapped three Israeli boys in the south, and they murdered them shortly after. Everyone was praying for them. It was much hours later, they, we found out that they already murdered them in a car as they were driving them around. Three boys, they were some hiking somewhere in the south. So the kid, one of the kids comes to the father and say to him, it's not the first time I'm here. My name used to be Avshalom. One of the boys, I believe his name was Avshalom, if I remember correctly. And then the girl said to the mother, you are not my first mother. I had a different mother before you. After interviewing those three kids, the triplet, we found out without any doubt that they are reincarnation of the three boys that were murdered. So what do we see over here? The three boys in their early 20s, 20, 21, were kidnapped, were murdered, and they were in Shamaim for 13 years, because they were just born two years ago, meaning they were 13 years somewhere. I don't want to say where, I don't want to offend anyone. For 13 years they were in a place, either they were in a not such a good place, which is cleaning the soul, which is very painful, or they were not there, but they were on hold. It's a place called Tohu, that the souls are being waiting for Hashem to reincarnate them back in a body of someone that is about to be born. Once a father and a mother, you know, they have intimacy and the mother is about to become pregnant tonight. So now Hashem has to decide to that baby that's starting to become a human being today, what soul to send to that body. And the soul of all the millions of souls that are waiting for one more chance to be reincarnated back to the world, to have another chance to pass the test, obviously, because they fail the past life test. So now they're getting another chance to come, but it has to be a perfect match. Hashem is the best matchmaker. He has to send a, a person that is waiting to be reincarnated into a family, a family that will fit him. For instance, if it's someone that didn't learn enough Torah, he was religious, but he didn't learn enough Torah. Why? Because his parents were very modern. Their father was a doctor, his mother was a lawyer. They didn't care about Torah. They cared about secular studies only. So they kept, you know, they kept the religion, you know, in a very modern way. It's a very common thing among the Jewish community here in New York. A lot of people are very modern. They don't learn an hour a week. They don't learn. They're busy. This one is a psychologist. This one is a dentist. This one is a lawyer. They don't have time for Hashem. They have time only for career. So one time, the person died. He kept Shabbat. He ate kosher. He did some good things in his life. But he didn't learn Torah. And the most important and most urgent thing in the life of a Jew is to learn Torah daily. So what happened? Hashem is willing to give them another chance and send them back to the world. But where will he send them? To another modern Orthodox family who doesn't appreciate the Torah? No. What is the point? So he sends them to an ultra-Orthodox family. The father is Talmud Chacham. From a very young age, all they see is Torah in the house, Torah in the Shabbat table, Torah, 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 Torah. Now they have no excuses. You can't say, I didn't know the value of the Torah. Look at your father, look at your mother, look at your brothers. Everyone is into Torah. Torah is the main thing in the house. It's very down-to-earth family. The Torah, the house is very holy. They send you to very good yeshiva. You had great rabbis. They taught you the importance of Torah. 
They taught you about the purpose of life. They taught you a lot of things that secular Jews have no idea what's going on in this world. None, not one secular Jew in the world knows the purpose of life. Not one. You cannot find one secular Jew who you ask him for five minutes questions about the purpose of life and he will know one of the answers. There's none. Nobody has any idea what they live for. They have no idea. What are you living for? To, to be successful, define success, to make money. That's the purpose of life. Money, it's a tool to help you to fulfill your purpose, but it's not the purpose. Uh, to get married. To get married for what purpose? I want to have kids. You can be a monkey for that. You don't have to be a human being. Monkeys also have kids. Uh, to be healthy. You can be a monkey. Monkeys are healthy. Monkeys don't need psychologists. They don't get bald. And they don't have gray hair. And no depression. Monkeys don't need Prozac. Like half of the Americans need daily. Monkeys don't need to smoke grass all day to relax them from the tension of life. Monkeys jump on the trees, they eat coconuts, bananas, peanuts, they jump to the water, they have females as much as they want, they have babies, they don't have to raise them. Very easy, very cheap, wonderful life. It could be an eagle, fly in the world, wonderful view. You eat as much as you want, you hunt in a second, you eat, you enjoy life. That's it, no stress. What is the purpose that the Creator made you a human being with a divine soul? And He gave you such an ability. Why are you being reincarnated? Animals are not being reincarnated. You don't say Kaddish for a dog that died. You don't even have to bury him. A dog you can throw to the garbage. The sanitation department, they can throw him, no problem. There's no problem, there's no violation of any rule. You want to bury your dog, it's very nice of you. But if you didn't bury him and they threw him with the garbage and he was eaten by other animals, it's not, he did not violate any rules because there is no remain to the soul, there's no soul by the dogs. Once the body died, it was only blood, nefesh. Once he's dead, there's no feelings, there's no continuation. But people, once they die, their real life begins. Once the soul exits the body, the soul goes up to the spiritual world, that's where it all begins. Being inside, trapped inside the physical body for X amount of years, that's only for the time being while you're being tested. That's why you have all these desires, physical desires, which always contradict spirituality. As the more spiritual you become, the less you care about the materialistic world. The less spiritual you are, the more addicted you are to cars and watches and all kinds of food, women, vacations, art, fancy jewelry. Someone that is very highly spiritual cannot care about these things, doesn't care. Doesn't care how delicious the food is, doesn't care about what the world has to offer because he knows that this world is a blink of the eye, it's anyway temporary. Before you realize it will be over. So the good news is that now we saw a horrible disaster, the Hamas murdered more than 1,200 people and kidnapped more than 200. Many of those kids that were murdered, many of these young people that were murdered, most of the people that died were very young. Even those who were in a party were in the early 20s. A lot of kids were murdered. Young women were murdered. Yeah, there were also old people, even some Holocaust survivors that they murdered. But most of the people were young. You wonder to yourself, what is these kids? They didn't even start their life. This one 16, this one 12, this one 3. They murdered little kids. What's going on over here? Not always is a bad thing. It's Hashem wants to take the soul out of this body because it's going to a different direction and send it right back in a new body to a new family with a better environment. So the death is not always a bad thing for the person that died. It's always bad for the people around it, the family, the friends, they suffer when they lose someone they love, brother, sister, parent, a child. Obviously, without them, life will be very difficult. But the actual soul, once the soul goes up to the upper world and sees what's going on there, and has been sent right back as a baby in a new city to new parents with a much better tools to become righteous. Maybe now he was in a kibbutz, all the people over there, almost all of them were lefty liberals, anti-religion, anti-God, 
anti-Judaism, they cannot stand the word Judaism, they cannot stand the word Torah, they cannot stand religious people, especially rabbis, they can't stand them, because from age zero they brainwash them against the religion. So every one of them say, I'm an atheist, don't talk to me about religion. Some places they don't even allow to have a synagogue, some of these kibbutzim. They, many of them were cooperating with Hamas on a daily basis. It's unbelievable how Hamas murdered many of the people who gave their life to help them. Unbelievable. People that used to complain against Israel in Holland, in the international court against Israel. People who used to tell the media all the negative things about the Israeli soldiers. People who used to go to Gaza, drive Palestinians into Israeli hospitals to give them the best treatment to help them and raise the money for them. And those are the ones that were murdered. Unbelievable. I understand until now they were focusing on religious people in Yerushalayim. Whenever they did an attack, they always look for religious people. Why? To make sure they're Jewish. Because anyone else may be Jewish, may not. But this particular attack, they targeted all the lefty kibbutzim. It's hard to believe. So you're wondering to yourself, why God did such thing? Of course, it's very deep. A lot of these lefties they have good heart. They were just very naive. They thought that you can live with these monsters next to them and try to build relationship that one day they leave us alone. They don't understand Ishmael in the Torah. The Torah already say, God say, once I created Ishmael, I want everyone to know that Ishmael is a wild beast. It's a verse in the Torah. It's not something that I made up or it's my opinion. It's nothing to do with my opinion. It's written, Ishmael pere Adam, a wild beast. Everything that will happen in the world, he will have his hand in it. And you see what's going on now. So what happened? A lot of these people were in such a crooked direction, there's no future for them. No future for them. Many of them were into drugs, all kinds of weird earrings, nose earrings, all kinds of weird haircuts, tattoos all over the body. And you ask yourself, what is the future of this teenager? Where is he heading? Is he ever going to be connected to God? Will he ever in his life have a chance to hear one hour of a Torah lecture? The answer is probably not. So what Hashem does, he makes him die, take his suffering to consideration, which is a very good repentance for the soul, especially if a person suffer before they killed him, take the soul out and make the soul reborn in a much better environment, spiritual environment. He was now in a kibbutz who hates religion. Now he will be born in Jerusalem to a very nice parents. The father is in yeshiva. He's going to give him Torah education. For that soul, is that an upgrade or a downgrade? A huge upgrade. The family will suffer tremendously. There's no question about the suffering of the families. They lost their children. But for the soul, is a huge upgrade. I remember there's a rabbi here in Queens. His granddaughter died from cancer, Lo Aleno. She was 17. Everybody was heartbroken. Nice religious girl, 17 years old. One day I spoke to him on the phone. He said, you're not going to believe what happened. My granddaughter came to me in a dream. And she said to me, Grandpa, why all of you are crying for me when I am in the highest, greatest pleasure that I can be? I'm in a huge light. I don't suffer. Why are you all suffering for me? He said that after that dream, it made them suffer a lot less. They, they already agree with what Hashem did. We obviously don't know why God does what he does. I mean, it looks terrible. We don't have an understanding. But the creator of the world is the only one who can calculate every second of your life, what you did right, what you did wrong, where you're born, what education you got, who you used to be in your past life. Once he takes all of that to consideration, and Rosh Hashanah, he decides if you're going to live or you're going to die. And if you're going to die, if you're going to have an express, or you're going to hell, or you're going to Kafakela, or you're going to be reincarnated. 
But even when you're going to be reincarnated, you're going to be reincarnated as a human being, as a human being without free will, such as autistic or Down syndrome, or a regular person with free will. Or you're going to be reincarnated in a dog, or in an axe, or in a snake, or in a crow. That could be another option. Or you're going to be reincarnated in a plant, in a fruit, in a vegetable. Or you're going to be reincarnated in raw material. There are many, many options when it comes to reincarnation. Obviously, the best reincarnation is to be reincarnated with a free will, like us. That now you can be righteous or wicked. It's up to you. You want to come and learn Torah. You want to improve your lifestyle. You want to become Shomer Shabbat. You want to be a, a person with good traits. You want to get rid of your ego. You want to get rid of your anger. You want to get rid of your ignorance. It's time to educate yourself. What's the purpose of life? Therefore, you're going to have a much higher chance to succeed in this life which you fell in your past life. All of that brings me to talk about what we read on Shabbat in Shul, in a synagogue. The life of Yaakov Avinu, the life of Jacob. Many people think that if my life is going according to my plan, it's a sign that God loves me. If my life is not working as I plan, that's a sign that God hates me or is not happy for me or he doesn't approve of my direction. What do you think? True or false? false. The answer, absolutely false. How do we know? Common sense say, when a biological father is happy from his son's behavior, he gets up early in the morning, he goes to school, he gets good marks, he treats the parents very nice, he dresses always nice and neat, he doesn't do stupid things, the parents never have to worry what kind of drug he may take. It's a great, great child. His, his future looks very promising. A father like this wants to do everything he can to help that child, or everything he can to ruin it for him. What common sense requires to say? Father like this wants to benefit such a boy, or he wants to stick a knife in his back? What do you think, no? I don't hear an answer. Benefit. Benefit. How would you react if you see that the father is the most strict with this boy when he has other three brothers that are terrible. What they say in America, losers. Three losers, the father gives them a lot of treatment, a lot of uh, attention. Try to help them, give them money, give them the car. And the great son, you can take the bus. You can manage with 50 bucks a week. Well, well, come on, Dad, you give this guy, this one, Dad, you give them hundreds of dollars, why you give me only 50? He's very strict with him. Abba, I need money, go work. What should I do? Go be a waiter. But I'm going to school. When you finish school, be a waiter. And it looks terrible. Five, six years like this. Three losers, bums. All they sleep, all they smoke drugs, do nothing with their life, no education, no work, no commitment. No respect for the parents, and the parents give them a lot of love and attention and money. The boy that gives his life for the parents, he's been treated in the most strict way. Make sense or no? What do you think? I'll tell you a story, you'll get the point. Two people were sick. They decided to go together to the doctor. Both of them suffer from a very, very high cholesterol, high sugar, meaning their life is in an immediate risk. They both overweight, they both have all kinds of, in a test is all negative, both heavy smokers, they cough, they can barely breathe. They come to the doctor, the doctor make the examination, he say to one of them, from this moment on you don't touch sugar, you don't eat meat, you don't eat fatty things, eat vegetables, eat this, you're not allowed to touch another cigarette, 
Scream, the doctor scream. Shame on you. You want your children to be orphans. You don't touch cigarettes. You don't touch cholesterol. You don't eat sugar. No ice cream, no candy, no chocolate, no alcohol. Okay, okay, calm down, doctor. The next one, you try to eat less. What do you mean, doctor? You can eat whatever you want, basically, but don't exaggerate. The guy said to the doctor, I don't get it. Me and my friend, we look more or less the same. We have the same lifestyle. Why are you so strict with him? Why are you so strict with him? You told him he cannot do, do eat this, you cannot do that, no smoking, no this, no that. And me, basically, live your life, do whatever you like. What's going on here? What's the answer? The doctor said, the first guy, there is a hope to save him. That's why I gave him all this restriction. You are already beyond the red line. You are lost case. Eat, enjoy until you die. There's nothing that can save you. This is how God looks at people. Some people already cross the red line. To get them back to be perfect, unfortunately, it's too late for it. But some people can still be saved. That's why he's still strict with them, he smacks them, he gives them all kinds of challenges. Why? To wake them up. And it's a verse in the Torah, Et asher yoav Hashem ye yasro. The one that God loves the most, he is strict with them. Now what did we just learn? Sign of strictness, problems in life, all kinds of stress that comes from God to our life, it's not a curse. It's sometimes the best blessing. What's the proof for that? October 7, thousands of Israelis who did not want to hear a word about religion, a word. You should see husband and wife, the guy is full of tattoos, I don't know if you saw that video. There's not one inch in his body without tattoos, everywhere. Neck, face, these, toes, fingers, everything. And his, uh, his wife, they were in that party. The Arabs, do you know how many miracles they had? They keep trying to shoot them, they miss, and the bullets go from left and right, and everyone around them died. And they made it, and they went to the car, and the policeman told them, go to this direction, and in the end, they went to the opposite direction. And if they would listen to him, they would all be dead. And now they became, Baruch Hashem, fully religious. So October 7th tragedy was a bad thing for this couple or the greatest thing that happened to them in their life? It was be better than winning the lottery. Yes, they had four or five hours of a nightmare. That nightmare gave them their ticket to life of eternity in the day they died. That nightmare. Without that nightmare, they would probably die one day as a complete, complete non-observant Jews. Mamash like non-Jews. Nothing. No Shabbat, no tefillin, no kosher food, no Torah, no nothing. You have to see them now. She already covered her hair. He puts kippah, tzitzit. They made a huge kiddush Hashem. I got their video more than 200 times on WhatsApp. More than 200 times from different people. Imagine the circulation of their video. Probably hundreds of thousands of people are inspired by the unbelievable miracle that this couple had. So you see that Hashem took them through four or five hours of, a, of hell. <laughs> Biggest nightmare, fear, panic attack, whatever you want to call it. And that was the best thing in their life. Same thing with many other examples in life. So Rabotai, the life of Yaakov Avinu is the best example for that. Who are the people that God loved the most in the history of the world? Let's name them together. People that were in the top of the list. Remember, we have eight billion people now in the world, and plus we had many billions of people that lived here in past generations. Who are the top 10? Top 10. One, Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, Yosef, Levi, 
Right, it's right there five. King David, six. King Hiskiyahu, seven. King Yoshiyahu, eight. Right there, eight people. Rabbi Akiva, nine. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, probably ten. We can argue, but there are a lot of other legends. But those probably are the top ten. Jacob is in the top ten. We are named after him. His name was changed to Israel. The nation of Israel is called Israelites, Israel, Israel, after Yaakov Avinu. Jacob, our father, his name was changed to Israel. Hashem blessed him. He will protect him. He will give him everything he needs. He will guard him on the way. And he will keep the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for their children for eternity and will never replace them with any other nation. Someone like Jacob that God loved him so much, did he have an easy life? Let's go together with how many tragedies he had in his life. You ready? First tragedy, he has a son that he loves the most. He's 17 years old. He learns with him every day Torah, Yosef. One day the brothers come with the, with the outfit full of blood. Do you recognize this? Yes, it's the outfit I made for Yosef. A bad animal ate your son alive. He's dead. Huge tragedy. Then one day there's hunger. There's nothing to eat. He has to go to Egypt. Then one day, Shechem ben Hamor sees his beautiful daughter Dina, and he goes and rape her, destroyed her life, brings huge shame to the nation of Israel, that he did such a thing to a religious girl, the daughter of Yaakov. Do you know what, it, you know what a horrible tragedy it is for a father to find out that some filthy, dirty monster did what he did to his daughter? I don't know what's worse. To find out that someone murdered her, or he did what they did to Dina. I'm not sure. I think that the other way is worse than a murder. And if you don't trust what I say, I don't know if you saw this Irish man. As an Irish man, he came to Israel to volunteer in a kibbutz. He met an Israeli girl, got married to her. He's a non Jew. But remember, the people over there in the south, they don't care so much about the religion. So she married a non Jew. She married a non-Jew. The, the, he already had kids from his first marriage. So what happened? He got married to this uh, Jewish girl, and they had this girl, Emily. She's eight years old. The Hamas kidnapped her. But they told him, they called him and said to him, we found out that your daughter was murdered by the Hamas. And they filmed him when he got the message on the phone. What was his reaction? Yes! Thank you, God! Thank you that she's dead! Meaning, what's better? That she will be in the hand of these monsters and they will do to her what they did to all the other girls? A little girl like this? <laughs> Just from the thought that she's in the hand of the filthiest monster Nazis on earth, it would go crazy. How can you fall asleep? I wouldn't fall asleep for months. Wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Probably get a heart attack from the, from the heartache. So he had a huge relief that she's dead. In the end, she wasn't dead. They found out a week ago she's alive, and yesterday she was released. Now they're going to find out what she had to go through, unfortunately. But she's back to him. But the interesting part is that the mother of this girl died. And he got remarried, and this stepmother, this stepmother that raised her also a murder now. So now she has no stepmother, no mother. Horrible story, horrible story. And the Prime Minister of Ireland, that the girl is Irish, the father is Irish Goy. So she's an Irish citizen, she has an Irish uh, passport. The president of, I of Ireland said a girl that was lost was found. It didn't say a girl that was kidnapped by these monsters. Look how the whole world is afraid to say that they are terrorists. Most of the world are afraid. 
they being politically correct, but dumb, dumb, it's stupid, but they don't want problems. Why? Their country is full of Arabs. They're afraid of riots. They're afraid of thousands of cars getting burned like they do in France, in England. They don't want riots. They know they're dealing with monsters. As soon as they're going to say one thing for the favor of the Jews, you know what's going to happen. So they're trying to keep it quiet. Why? Let's not wake up the bear. Let him is relaxed now in a corner eating. Don't start with the bear. We have millions of people here in Europe with the Hamas ideology that are willing to slaughter all of us, all Europeans. You want to trigger them now? A few times they made riots already. They burned thousands of stores, thousands of cars. They shoot at people. They're very, very violent. Even in a soccer game between France and Morocco, Morocco lost and they started to do riots all over Paris. There's more than five million right there. They pray in the middle of the street, they block the street, they don't care about the French people, they curse them, they intimidate them. The police in France is afraid to come near them. They don't go to the Muslim quarter. Even someone call at 9 p.m., someone is being murdered, they don't come. I saw a documentary that they come with a special car that it's all protected metal, that you can't even shoot at them. You can shoot even RPG. The car is safe. So you know what they do? They burn the car. They burn them inside the car, the police they're in France. So the police say, even with these cars, we don't go. This is what's happening in Europe now. So the last thing they want is to show, oh, we have uh, sympathy to the Israelis who were murdered. They're afraid. You see, Gaddafi, Machimo was the president of Libya. Gaddafi, when they told him, we want you to give up your nuclear project. He started to have nuclear, like Iran. They said to him, listen, we give you all kinds of benefits. Give up your nuclear. He agreed right away, without fighting. He gave it up. And they kept him there until they made a revolution and they murdered him in the most brutal way you can imagine. I don't want to tell you how they murdered him. If you, he was hiding from the mob. When they finally caught him, you know what the Arabs did to him? If, you would, if I'll tell you now, you won't sleep a week how they killed him. But this uh, Gaddafi one time said in a speech, I don't need nuclear. The world is ours, Muslims. All we have to do, continue to give birth to a lot of kids, that's it. Another generation, we will be all over the world. And then we'll destroy them. We don't need to fight. What do I need nuclear? Just continue to have 10, 12 kids in every Muslim family. The European has one and a half child and three dogs. That's it. Same thing in America. How many, uh, an average family in America, how many kids they have? Two. An average secular Israeli family, two to three kids. And that's high compared to the Western world. An Arab family, eight and up. An ultra-Orthodox family, eight and up. What keeps the Jewish nation alive is only the Orthodox people. Without them in two or three generations, the Jewish nation will be vanished. Nothing will be left. The secular people in Israel are fighting the religious education. They fight not to give budget to yeshivot. They fight against all kinds of Torah projects. But they don't understand. If you eliminate the religion in Israel, the next generation or two, there will be no Jews left. The secular Jews are giving very, very little birth, and almost all of them get married to non-Jews. More than 70% are married to non-Jews, and they vanish, that's it. The Jewish nation started in the same generation like the first Chinese men, 4,200 years ago. The father of the Jews, his name was Shem, the son of Noah. When someone hates Jews, they call him anti-Shemi, anti-Semite. Shem was the founder of the Jewish race. Abraham came from him, Isaac, Jacob, the tribes, all of them from Shem, who came from Noah after the flood, when the world restarted 4,200 years ago. So what happened? In the same generation that Shem started, his brother Ham 
had a grandson, his name was China, Chinese, Viola de Tassini. Our father, the starting of the Jewish race, live in the same generation like the starter of the Chinese race. And Chinese, you have two billion right now, and Jews, you have only 15 million. Meaning, more than 99% of the Jews disappeared from the face of the earth because of intermarriage, simulation. Because they didn't listen to the creator of the world who gave us the Torah in Mount Sinai in front of millions of witnesses. And he told us, I do not allow you to marry other nations. You only can marry your own nation because if you marry all the nations of the world after two, three generations, not, none of you will be left. So the only reason that today we still have Jews in the world is only thanks to the Torah. If there was no Torah, Nobody would know who the Jews are. No one would be left. That's it. Everyone would marry everyone. That's it. There's no more. Do you know how many nations disappear from the world? Where are the Romans? Disappear. The ancient Greeks disappear. The ancient Babylonians disappeared. The ancient Persians disappeared. All the, the Philistines disappeared. Not Palestinian. Philistine. It's a different nation. Disappeared. All these nations disappear, Ninveh, Ashur, Moab, Ammon, all of them are gone. All the, na all the nations that are mentioned in the Torah, all of them are gone, except one nation, the Jews. The Jews are still around. Where are the Romans? Where are the ancient Greeks? Disappeared. Even Egyptian, the Pharaoh, the nation of Pharaoh, disappeared. The biggest empire of those days. Egypt that you see today are Arabs. They have nothing to do with Pharaoh. Pharaoh was a different nation. They were not Arabs. Different nation in Egypt. They are gone. Now Arabs took over Egypt. It's, a whole, it's 80, 80 million Muslims from the children of Ishmael. Where are Pharaoh and his nation? Gone. There's no one in the world that can say, oh, I'm from that nation. They're all gone. Even American Indians, give it two, three more generations, they'll be gone. They get married, this, and slowly, slowly, they disappear. Almost all the nations eventually disappear. And the Jewish nation will never disappear as long as they have the Torah. Because what made us a nation is the Torah. Without the Torah, we will not be around. That's what a lot of secular people don't understand. Defeating the religion Fighting to destroy the religion is fighting to destroy your nation. Once there will be no officially Jews, they'll take over Israel in a minute from you. What are you going to have to fight for? If your children won't feel Jewish because you married all the other nations, what reason do they have to insist to stay in Israel? The only reason people now are in Israel is either because they were born there or because they went there because it's written in the Torah that it's the Holy Land. If you take the Torah out of the equation, you would not have one million Jews today in Israel. The only reason you have all these Jews in Israel that came from Morocco, Yemen, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Poland, Russia, Germany, all these nations, they're all it's because of the Torah. All the Aliyah in the last few years to Israel is from United States, Canada, and France. Why? The, who comes? All religious people. Secular people barely make any aliyah to Israel. Ask nefesh ben nefesh. 99% of the people there are all religious. Why? Why would a secular American wants to do aliyah to Israel? What is what Israel for him? He doesn't care about Israel. He's pro Hamas. 70% are reform, progressive, anti-Israel Jews like Bernie Sanders. Shem Rishayim Irkav. Bernie Sander and the rest of his friends, all these communist socialists, they hate Israel, they are pro-Palestinians, the last thing they care about if there will be Israel or not. So this is what's going on here. So going back to Yaakov Avinu, his daughter was raped. His brother chasing him with 400 mercenaries to murder him. He has to run away from his parents' home and hide. 20 years, his father-in-law, one of the biggest crooks in the history of the world, that God is 
describing him in the Torah is a master of deceiving. A real crook, Lavan Aramai. Seven years he took advantage on him. He worked for free to get his daughter Rachel. Of course, in the end, he didn't give him Rachel. He gave him Leah. How did he fool him? There was no electric. It was dark at night. You do a wedding outside, it's dark. You can see faces. Cover her face. In the morning, sun is rising. He finds out in his bedroom, her sister Leah. What's going on here? You tricked me. Come on, you really expected me to give you the younger daughter before the older one? It's not acceptable in our society. Don't worry, work seven more years, I'll give you Rachel also. And then, work six more years that you can have your own sheep. How many years he took advantage on him? 20 years he worked like a slave. Slave. The most important person in the world that God loved the most. The Torah is full of description how much Hashem loves him, how much Hashem spoke to him, how much Hashem blessed him. And his life was worse than all of our life combined. Anyone here would raise his hand and say, I had a horrible life. And you begin to describe to me all the worst thing that happens to you in your life does not come to 5% of the misery that Yaakov had in his life. Think about it, 20 years to be a slave, working for the biggest crook, takes advantage on you. Then one day you run like a thief. You have to take your, your wives and the children and you run away and he chase you after a week. What is going on? Why you left like a thief? You know, he came to kill him. And what happened in the end? Hashem had to interfere with his plan. So don't dare to hurt Yaakov. I don't get it. You believe in an idol. You have a statue. Every day you take your stupid statue. Help me with living, Parnassa, watch my health. You little fool. This was made in China a week ago. You, you bought it in a store. How do you believe that this is your God? Okay, you're stupid enough to believe in some idol. Go to the East. Go to China, Thailand, India, all these places. Every non-Jew there is an idol worshiper. Some worship the cow, some worship Buddha, some worship other, uh, other idols. But there's one thing I don't get it. If I am a stupid idol worshiper who bow down to my stupid idol every day and believe that it's guarding me, if I chase someone that I want to hurt and the real God of the world is coming to me and warn me, don't dare to mess with Yaakov. After that, how can I not repent? Okay, God, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you were running everything. I will not hurt Yaakov and I also want to be righteous. Help me out. I want to be in relationship with you. What does he do? He comes, he comes to Yaakov. Why you stole my God? You little fool. You, the real God just spoke to you. What do you mean, why you stole my God? You know what's the worst part? That Yaakov didn't have any idea what he's talking about because Rachel took it and she hid it. She was sitting on a camel and she hid it under herself. And Yaakov, since he did not know, he said, if anyone here stole your God, he should die. And the love of his life, Rachel died age 36. She gave birth to Yosef, who, according to Yaakov, was murdered. Animal ate him alive. And then the second boy, Binyamin, while giving birth to Binyamin, she died. The love of your life died after a few years you've been married to her. She gave birth to Binyamin, and your life is over. The woman you love the most in your life, she just died. How many tragedies? 20 years being a slave to the biggest crook. 20 something years hiding for your brother who looks for you to murder you with 400 murderers, mercenaries, Hamas and Hezbollah terrorists are looking to kill you. Try to live one day knowing the Hamas put a, a, a tag on your head. Everywhere you go, you live in a fear, Iran, Hezbollah, every person around you, you know what it is to live 20 years with fear? That your brother is searching for you to murder you? You know what it is that your daughter was raped and kidnapped by some filthy person? Do you know what a life he had, Yaakov Avinu? So please explain to me now. 
If God writes in the Torah, there's no one he loves more than him. Why did he give him such a nightmare in his life? What do we learn from here if we are clever? That this world is a blink of the eye. It's very, very temporary. Don't pay too much attention to the suffering. Before you realize it will be over. What is it like? I'll give you an example. A person come to, to pass the road test. A road test. There is a company who wants to hire him as a semi-trailer driver, paying $3,000 a week cash. He has a great semi-trailer with a bed, great stereo system, bar, refrigerator. You know, all he has to do, drive, listen to some lectures on the highway, enjoy, sleep in the truck, make good money, very good, but he needs to pass the road test. How long is the road test? Five minutes. Five minutes. Drive straight, make a right, blink, make a left, make a U-turn, park, pass or fail. Now imagine he comes to the test and the semi-trailer, the tester sitting next to him, and the air condition doesn't work. It's a hot day. It's very hot in the car. The chair is hard. Oh, it breaks my back. The wheel is hard. Usually it's soft, but today it's a little bit harder. He complained to the tester. Oh, what a car. Oh, I can't breathe. Look at it. It smells bad. There's no air condition. Why the chair doesn't go back? I'm used to take it back in my, in my father's car. What's going on here? The tester say, listen, you little fool, you are going to be five minutes in my car. Later, you're going to be 60 years in the fancy semi-trailer that is waiting for you. Why do you care so much about the five minutes? Just get it over with. This is this world. 78 years, a blink of the eye. Care if I, it's over. What comes after, it's eternity. Do you think that Yaakov now when he's in heaven for already 3,500 years, do you think for a second now in heaven he's thinking about the horrible life he had? About what happened to Dina? What happened to Yosef? How he had to move to Egypt? How all the things happened to him? How 20 years he was taken advantage of? How his wife died young? Do you think he thinks about it for a second from the minute his soul went up to heaven? <laughs> If that's what you think, then obviously you have zero understanding about how life is working, how the Torah is, and what's, how Hashem is running the world. So let's learn some insight. Remember, I told you many times, the Torah is not a history book. Yes, it describes uh, a thousand years of history, the history of our nation, but that wasn't the purpose of the Torah. Torah means instructions. Torah milashon ora'a. Torah, it's like or, Torah or, it brings the light to the life. It's food for the soul. The body has different kinds of food. What food the body needs? Who can name to me all the food the body needs? Food that we eat, drinks that we drink, relationship, what else? A little sport, exercise, you know and all kinds of other pleasure that the body needs from time to time. What does the soul need? Only spirituality. Torah, prayers, reading Tehillim, doing chesed to people, feeling great about it, feeling connection to the creator of the world, feeling the light of God on your soul, reflecting on your soul, like the Ramchal brings in his book, uh, The Way of Hashem. We made a whole series about it. The more closer you get to God, the more light is going on your soul. Once you feel that light on your soul, there is no greater pleasure than that. By the way, because people are so far from God and their soul is so much in the darkness, that's why almost everyone run to drugs. Almost everyone. It's never been like this in the past. When I was a child, who smoked grass in Israel? No one. No one. If one person smoked drugs, everyone knew he's a big criminal. Forget about drugs. How many times I told you the story when I was in eighth grade? Eighth grade 
אין בית ספר א' ד' גורדון, זכותו יגן עליו. א' ד' גורדון, אין בת ים. one guy, 13 years old, started to smoke cigarette. And the whole city of בת ים, which was totally not religious, city on a beach, almost no one was religious. No yeshivot, barely few synagogues, barely, in a whole city. The entire city knew him. Be careful from that criminal. Why? Because he smoked cigarette. This was the level of the secular people 42 years ago exactly. Two generations ago. 42 years ago, about time. That's it, two generations ago. Meaning in the time of your grandparents, or some of you young boys here. If someone smoked cigarette, he was a criminal. If someone had a tattoo, he was a criminal. Nobody wants to talk to him. If someone touched drugs, now one person will agree to talk to him. No one. Secular. Forget about religious. Stay away from this guy. People thought a million times before the cares. Nobody cares. Among the guys, when the parents were not around, yet today, Shemirachem, how people talk. What happened? People went too far away from God and from the book, the book of life. That's why the soul is so lonely, so empty, so far, does not get any reflection of any divine light. And as a result of that, everyone is searching for spirituality. Since they cannot find they look at people that do drugs and they think, oh, he's in the moon. Later they will be dead and go to hell. That's the moon that they get. Unfortunately. Thinking, oh, it's helping me. But uh, we don't need all this garbage. <laughs> we, have, we have connection to Hashem. Every time we learn, we feel unbelievable. Feel the light. When, uh, when you read Tehillim, you want to cry. You, you have to hold the tears. Where does it come from, these emotions? That's called spirituality, ruchaniyut. Let me read to you some of the things we read on Shabbat that you probably didn't pay attention to. In the book of the Kuzari, Kuzari, it was about 800 years ago, there was a nation of Goim named Kuzar. And they decided to become religious, but they didn't have a religion. There were three major religions in the world, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. So they started to debate them. They came to the Arabs, they came to the Christians. Then they came to the Jews, they spoke to Rabbi Yehuda Levi, even almost 800 years ago. They asked a lot of questions, they had a king. And in the end, they decided they will all convert to Judaism. They became all converts. Now I want to tell you, you know, if you know, convert is a very, very high level of a Jew. Very high level. It's not a regular Jew from birth. Because a, a regular Jew from birth, the Torah says not to deceive him, not to lie to him, not to steal for him, not to kill him, yes. But when it comes to, gen, to Gentiles that converted, became Jewish, there are 36 verses in the Torah how to admire them and respect them and not to deceive them and to help them and not to take advantage on them. If someone messed with a convert, it's much worse than to mess with a Jew from birth. Also with a Jew from birth, you're not allowed. Also with Gentiles, you're not allowed to mess. But if you mess with a Gentile that became a Jew, it's similar to hurting an orphan or a widow, when the Torah said that if the orphan and the widow would scream to me because you're giving them hard time, I will punish you severely. A huge punishment. The converts are in the same category. Why? They come from a different nation. Once they convert to Judaism, they have no more connection to their old days. Their biological family are not their family. Once they go into the mikveh, they go in. Christina, she comes out Sarah. The Christina is no longer exist. She gets a new soul merging into her. It's a whole different person. Not only that, even two brothers that convert, 
Once they go in, let's say Chris and Jack, two non-Jews, they go into the mikveh, as they come out, it's like two babies who were just born. They really don't have biological parents anymore, because it's new souls that merge into them once they go into the mikveh. Why? They have to go deep into the water, spiritual, natural water. Why? Because going into the mikveh, the water that covers the person, the bad spirit that exists on every one of us, cannot enter water. Spirit cannot enter water. Going into the water, purify a person. Even when a person is impure because he touched a dead body or something, even dead body you need a red cow, it's a, it's a little bit more strict impurity. But let's say a woman has her nida, she goes into the mikveh once the blood is over, it purifies her, I'm talking spiritually, not, uh, not physically. Physically she can take 5,000 showers and clean herself from head to toe, but she's still impure. This is spiritual impurity, nothing to do with the dirt. You can be sweaty, you didn't take a shower, you go into the natural lake, in and out, you purified yourself, even though you smell not so good. Because the body is not so clean, but we're not talking about the cleanness of the body. We're talking about the spiritual purity. So, Abotai, when someone converts, he becomes a son of God, a daughter of God. Attacking them, putting them down, making them upset, is going directly against son's children, Hashem's children. You have to be super stupid to do such thing. So, for instance, let's say if you, want, if you have people come in a synagogue to collect money in the morning. A lot of Hasidim comes. You give this one dollar, dollar, dollar. Oh, you see one? Ger Tzedek, a convert. Give him five. And have in mind to make God extra happy. Why? You should love the converts. Do you understand or no? Yeah, Rav Sharia Devlitsky was one of the biggest rabbis of our generation. He was also a very big Kabbalist, very holy man. So a friend of mine is a rabbi in Israel. He was learning with him every day. He used to go to his house and they learn two, three hours every day. So there was a cleaning guy, a non-Jew in Israel, cleaning guy that cleaning the shul. One time, the cleaning guy decided to convert. All day he hears Torah in the shul. He got the point that Judaism is the divine truth. So he decided to convert. From the minute he converted, Rav Sharia Devlitsky doubled his pay for cleaning the shul. He used to make a thousand shekel, let's say. Now he gave him two thousand shekel. So my friend, the rabbi, asked him, Rabbi, why all of a sudden you double his salary? Because he didn't ask for a raise. He was paying uh, well before. He said, now you have to treat him all different. He's a convert, he's Ger Tzedek. Every time I give him double, I have in mind to make Hashem pleased. Why? The Haftai Tager. So the, the, you see that a person can be a complete lost goy and decide to do the right thing and he sacrifice and he come and he begins to keep Shabbat and modesty, and kosher food, and comes to learn Torah every day. And then he goes into the mikveh, you know, and it's Baruch Hashem, a whole new, brand new baby. These converts, they have a huge reward in the afterlife. Why? It's not someone that grew up in religion, all his parents were religious, everyone around learned Torah, holidays, it wasn't something new to him. Someone who come from far, I don't know, Italian, Chinese, Thailandi, Indian, even Arabs, a few Arabs even converted. What background they have? They, they have nothing. They come from zero. They start from zero, and then they begin to learn Hebrew, and they're starting to learn all the customs, and every day it's a new school for them. They learn more and more and more and more. This is unbelievable. That's why the Torah is so sensitive about this. So the Kuzarim, they all converted. Who are the Kuzarim today in the Jewish nation? Georgians. Some say, I don't know for sure, but it's very logical that the Georgian Jews are the Kuzarim. 
the Gruzinim, from Gruzia. Why people say it? Because the, the Georgians don't have any Kohanim. You go to Georgian Shul, no Kohanim. The Kohanim are Bukharian and Persians and Syrians. But they don't have any Kohanim. One time a Georgian rabbi said to me, why you, why you say it? That's not true. I say, well, first of all, it's not a shame to be a, a grand grandson of a convert. This is real converts. They converted for the truth of Hashem. They had a very high level. There's nothing to be ashamed of. So no, no, we're not ashamed of it, but it's simply not true. So I say to him, why it's not true? He said, because when Bet HaMikdash was built, we sent all of our Kohanim into Jerusalem. They needed to serve in Bet HaMikdash. So I say to him, oh yeah? What about the lefty Kohanim? Those who write with their left hand, they're not, they can't do the, 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 the service in Bet HaMikdash. What about those who have birth defects? Not one Kohen left in the entire Georgia. It should have been today thousands. One person after 2,000 years can become a tribe. So why do I say that we don't know for sure? Why do I say? Because even Kohanim that did not serve in Bet HaMikdash, they use them for side services. Like they took care of the wood, they made them dry. When they chop them, they make them dry because when you put it in a fire on a Bet HaMikdash, they have to be dry. If they are humid, the fire cannot burn the tree. The tree has to be completely dry. So the Kohanim that were lefty or they had all kinds of defects, they still gave them all kinds of things to do, but they were not directly in holiness. They were side missions. So there is still a possibility that maybe they send even the ones with the defects to Jerusalem. Maybe it's possible, I don't know, only Hashem knows. But one thing we do know, that there was a nation of the Kuzarim and they all converted. Now listen to what's written in the book of the Kuzari. It says like this, there are four levels in the creation. We have people, we have animals, chai, we have tzomeach, plants, trees, and we have raw material, domem. Again, domem, meaning raw material that cannot move, it's the lowest level. What's the next level above? Tzomeach, things that grow from the ground. That's a higher level. What comes after that? Chai, creatures, all kinds of species, dogs, cows, sheep, camels, horses, every animal. But they don't speak. They don't speak the divine language. And then there is one level above the animal, it's Chai Medaber. Chai is a species that is alive and also speak and have a divine soul. That's, those are people. So people, animals, plants, and trees, and raw material. Say the Kuzari in a book, it says like this. A person has all four in him. He's alive. He has blood like animals, okay. He's growing. Also eating things that grows. And also have raw material in him, bones and stuff. And he's able to speak, which the other doesn't have all four. So he says like this. It says, since a person has all four, he is the most dangerous to the world. He can destroy the world. For instance, which animal is more dangerous? A human being that wants to kill or a lion that wants to kill? Who is considered a bigger criminal? Lion wants to kill the zebra now. He's hungry. Person wants to kill his competition in a business. Who is a bigger criminal? Obviously, a person is a monster. It's a killer. Some places will give him a death penalty. No one is coming with any complaints to the lion for eating the zebra. Why? <laughs> he needs to eat. He has no other way. That's the way of war, the world, the nature. But a person has a way not to kill. If he kills, it's for personal greed. For personal reason. 
The animals don't kill because of greed or racism or all kinds of other human hatred, no. But the interesting thing, Rabotai, every level is included in a level above him. We have raw material, the raw material is included in the plants. The plants that grow has raw material, material and plants, they are included in the animals. The animals, which is raw material and growing and alive, is included in a human being. So, so far we have one, two, three, four. The level of the human being has also something that no one else has, is a divine soul. Meaning a spark from God himself, which is eternal, is in the soul of Adam. And from then on, it went to all his children. All the eight billion people in the world have that spark in them. That's why when a soul comes out of the body, the soul can never die. The soul cannot die. The soul has no limitation of memory, of distance, of traveling. The soul can be reincarnated in a mosquito. Right now, the soul is in your body. You are six feet tall. The soul fills up your body. It's a spirit. If Hashem decides that you'll be reincarnated in a bee, or in a butterfly, or in a tiny mosquito, that soul, that right now is functioning your entire body, can go into that mosquito, or into that little dog, or into that little raven. So the soul is not limited to space. The soul cannot be cut. If it cuts in the middle, now it's going to be half and half. Half a pound and half a pound. Cut it again, four quarters. Cut it again, eight eighths. No. The soul, you can cut a million times the same soul, like, a, like fire. You have a candle. From one candle, you can make a thousand candles. It does not decrease the fire of the first temple at the candle. You understand what I'm saying, right? So, Rabotai... Yaakov come and he see Rachel for the first time. Once it's your soulmate, immediately something happens when you see the woman that's supposed to be your wife. What does it mean, soulmate? What does it mean? When the soul of a man comes into the world, there is a soul of a woman that comes to the world that belongs to that soul of the man. At one point, there were one soul. And then they split to two. One comes to the world, and the next one comes to the world right after. Could be five years later. Once the next soul comes to the world, Hashem finds the right time to put them together. Oh, I have a girl for you. You should date her. She's great. She's that. She's that. Where? What? Oh, they go out on a date. If it's the right soulmate, I will go through. If not, someone will already ruin it. It's not meant to be. I want to tell you an interesting story. You know, Rav Chaim Kanievsky passed about a year ago. He was the biggest rabbi on earth, close to 95 when he passed. And uh, one person came to him. He was uh, in his 40s. Person in his 40s, not married. He came to Rav Chaim Kanievsky and he said to him, Rabbi, can you give me a blessing to get married? I can't find my soulmate. Rav Chaim Kanievsky told him, your soulmate were not born yet. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what a horrible news you just found out? You in your 40s and your soulmate were not, were not born. Meaning, let's say she will be born tomorrow. Give her 20 years to become an adult. That means you're not going to get married for the next 20 years. You'll be in your 60s. It's a disaster. Plus, usually a 20 years old girl doesn't want a man in his 60s. So what is he telling you, the rabbi, that you're going to die single? It's very bad news. But three months later, they found him a girl. And it was a perfect match. What did they find out? Few days after he went to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, this girl converted. So that soul didn't come to the world yet. But few days later, she went into the mikveh. She got that soul. And once she got it, someone made a great shiduch and they got married. 
See, it's unbelievable. I want to tell you a story. Many years ago, there was a Korean girl. She was dating an Israeli Temani, Yemenite Temani. They had a very intense relationship. But the Temani, he said to her, listen, we are the Temanim. We were all very religious. I'm the first one in my family that is not so religious. My father is traditional. My grandfather was a Mori in Yaman teaching Gemara. You want to marry me? You have to convert. So the girl went to start learning how to convert. So she, the more she learns, Rabbi, back then they didn't have your book yet, Welcome to Judaism. She had to do it the hard way. Rabbi Golan is a blessing for the generation. He's in the bed in here of Rabbi Yaw bin Chaim in Queens. And because they have, who knows how many, probably thousands of cases in the last 30 years of people coming to convert, so he gathered everything into one book. Welcome to Judaism. It's a blessing. You have it in four languages. Hebrew, English, Russian, and Spanish. Beautiful on them. Expensive paper with pictures, with instructions. Give it to me if, you, if we're already mentioning it. So, Baruch Hashem, in one book, if you learn this book perfectly from A to Z, you're basically ready for conversion. As you can see here, and it, uh, it's mamash unbelievable. All the pictures inside, instructions, 13 principles, 10 commandments, how to pray. Unbelievable relationship, women, mikveh, raising children, everything you got there. So today when someone tells me, okay, I want to convert, first thing I say to him, you must know this book by heart. Once you know this book by heart, when you come around Jews, you'll be surprised. Sometimes you'll know better than them. I gave this book, remember the Hasid who helped us to store it? Hasid Satmer, religious from birth. He's probably 35. All his life religious, learning yeshivot. So he helped us to store those books. So he was curious. He started to read it. He said to me, you know how many things in the book I didn't know about? You know how many things it educated me? I started to tell my friends, the Hasidim, trust me, you need this. Why? Because even us that will learn Torah for so many years, there are certain things over there that not everyone knows. So, the, the interesting part is this Temani said to the girl, you have to convert. So she started to convert. So she went to Ulpana, somewhere in Israel. She started to learn daily. Then she came back to convert. She said to the Temani, I don't want you. <laughs> Sorry, you're not religious enough for me. <laughs> the Temani came to me and said, well, I got her to convert. Now she's dumping me. So it's, it's, it's about time you wake up and do tshuva. He had no choice. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, he became very, very religious, and then they moved to Israel, they established a beautiful religious family, and he, in the end, became, if I'm not, rem if I'm not mistaken, until today is an avrech, learning Torah. Hashem has his way. Sometimes you don't know how it happens. Sometimes you think you're going to take the Goya and send her for conversion, but in the end, she's going to save your soul. You want to be with me? I'm Shomer Shabbat. I'm going to be modest. I'm going to go to the mikveh. I, it's strictly kosher. You sure you want to be with me? Listen, I only sent you to get the paper. I didn't expect you to be a rabbit sand. What do you mean? It's the truth. I told you the story about the Sicilian uh, Italian Goyarno. You listen to this. One day, uh, one time I get a phone call from an Israeli from Florida, Cohen. Cohen, Israeli. Rabbi, ma arasta li tachayim. You ruined my life. Ma, I have a non-Jewish girlfriend. She is Sicilian. We just watched your debate with the Christian priest, the, the professor. She told me, listen, I'm not allowed to be with you. I'm sorry. What do you mean? God is not happy that Jews go with non-Jews. It's against the Torah. It's nothing to do with racism. Nothing to do with racism. I explained it many times. 
It's nothing to do with who's better. The, the Goy or Goya can be a million times better than a Jew. And the Jew has restriction not to go with anybody that is not Jewish. It's restriction regardless who is better. So what's going to be now? The guy said to, I said to him, why don't you come to, to Monsi, to our yeshiva, be two, three weeks, learn, we will help you. No, I'm working, my boss is going to fire me. So I said to him, I don't understand. She's more religious than you. She's telling you that she's not allowed to be with you. You watch the debate. You watch the truth and you don't care, but she cares. He said to me, apparently. Tov, Rabotai, what happened? They have a child now, together. She said to him, take the boy, convert him. I'm not Jewish, so the kid is not Jewish. Convert him. Take him, raise him as a Jew. I would live with that. Look what a, a noble woman. So now it really breaks the heart. We have such a, it's a tragedy. Family, they have to get divorced now. <laughs> They're not married. They don't need to get divorced. What happened? A few months later, the girl is now wondering about her origin. She started to investigate. She found out that her grandmother was Jewish. She went to the Bed Din Agadol in Jerusalem, the big Jewish court. They, she gave them all her findings. They continued their research. And they gave her a letter that she is originally a Jew. And she doesn't need to convert. Why it's critical? Because if she would convert to Judaism, she cannot marry a Kohen. Kohen cannot marry a convert. All other Jews can marry converts. The Kohanim, the family of the Kohanim, they're not allowed to marry converts. So even if she would convert, it would still not be allowed to be with her. So then you have to separate them. But she went and found out that all alone she was Jewish. And they were able to have a few more kids, I believe six or seven. Baruch Hashem. She moved to Israel, they moved to Israel. So here you go, sometimes it's a happy end. You know, time is running out. Yaakov sees Rachel and begins to cry. He begins to cry. Why Yaakov is crying? Imagine you go on the first date with a girl and you begin to cry. The girl asks you, Rachel asks you, Yaakov, is everything okay? Ah, what happened? You're making me nervous. Ah, what happened? Why are you crying? No, what's the reason? Why is crying? He's so emotional. He see a woman, he falls in love with her, he begins to cry, tears. When a man is emotional, very sensitive, he sees something and begins to cry right away. It's a good sign or a bad sign? All the macho guys say. Of course it's a good sign. It shows that your neshama is pure. You see something is not right, you f your neshama feels the pain. It's a very good sign to be emotional. What's better, to be a heart of a, of a rock? The Torah says, I will remove the heart of stone from you. Meaning it's not good to have a heart that is too stiff. But anyway, Rabotai, listen to this. Why Yaakov is crying? Because he came with empty hands. He didn't have any gift to bring. When Yitzchak... When Avram sent Eliezer to get Rivka for Yitzchak, he came with many camels full of jewelry, candy, food. Wow, what an impression. Yaakov came with empty hands. Why? Why he came with nothing? He, is, he was very rich. What happened to all the money? The son of Esav, Eliphaz, robbed him. Eliphaz came and said to him, Rabbi, you're my rabbi, my uncle, but my father told me to kill you. Tell me what to do. Yaakov said, take away everything I have, you leave me with nothing. Someone that was rich and became very poor, it's count like he died. Ani chashuv kemet. Why? He cannot benefit the world. Just like a dead person that cannot benefit the world. Take away everything. Why did he leave him with no clothes? Left him with his underwear in a lake. 
Hashem made a miracle. After a few minutes, a few hours, he saw a dead body of a non-Jewish soldier. He took off his clothes, got dressed, and moved on with his life. Now he's broke. Now I want to ask you a question. When did he go to learn in a yeshiva of Shem Vaever for 14 years? After Eliphaz robbed him or before? Huh? After? No, what do you say? Before or after? <laughs> so when he left, when he left his parents' house, because his, his mother Rivka found out that Asa wants to kill him, she said to him, go to my brother. Go to my brother, Lavan. Better to be by the crook than to be dead, no? So he went, Vayetse Yaakov, Right? How does the parasha start? Huh? Yaakov went to what city? Vayelech Harana. Meaning to the city of Haran, where Lavan lives. But Yaakov didn't go there. Where did he go? Huh? Yeshiva. To Yeshiva. So he was 14 years in Yeshiva. So when Eliphaz rabbed him? Before the Yeshiva or after the Yeshiva? You see, even things of kindergarten, we don't know. No? Huh? Before. Why? Because Rashi said that his intention was to go to Haran, but his plans changed. Why his plan changed? After Eliphaz robbed him, he decided instead of going to Lavan, to go to Yeshiva. What changed? Just like now. There was October 7. Many people lost everything they had. Rabbi, I want to I want to become religious. You have room for me in yeshiva? I want to come tomorrow morning. Why? I have nothing else to live for. Please let me become tzaddik. It happened to hundreds of kids. They want to go into yeshiva. Why? They realize life, to, now you're here, tomorrow you're not here. I might as well get something out of this life. Yaakov lost everything he has. You know what? Hashem gave me this punishment. Let me go and learn Torah 14 years in the yeshiva of Shem Vaever. That's the reason or no? No. Yaakov was already a tzaddik before. He didn't need the yeshiva to turn him into a tzaddik. We need the yeshiva. One day we're not in the yeshiva, we go down. One day. Immediately we go down. Why? The atmosphere in the world is below horrible. What's happening out there? Terrible. Salom and Gomorrah. Every day in Yeshiva, inspire and lift your soul. But Yaakov was a holy man. He was learning Torah even in his parents' house. Yaakov, Ishtam, Yoshev, Alim. All his life he learns Torah. Even before he went to the Yeshiva. So what is the, what, why now all of a sudden he decided to go to Yeshiva? He was on the way to get married. On the way to Lavan to find Shiduch. But there's a change in the plan. 14 years, the Shiduch will be delayed now. The answer is, there is an argument when a person should get married. First, he should get married and then learn Torah. Or first, he should learn Torah and then get married. There's an argument. The Rambam say a person should first learn Torah and then get married. Once you're already 21, 22, 23, you're full of Torah, you're learning from age 4, you're already 22, you learn 18 years, Baruch Hashem, Talmid Chacham. Maybe you finish us once or twice. The old Shulchan Aruch, all the Musar books. Baruch Hashem, you're well established. Why? Once you get married, your wife is not going to let you learn full time. As righteous as she may be, there are chores to do in the house. Help me go to the supermarket, pick up the son, pick up the daughter, drive them to school, come, I don't feel good today, can you come early? Take me out, we need to go to my parents, my mother is sick, let's go, let's visit. There are things. 
When I was in yeshiva, there was one guy there, with no exaggeration, every hour his wife used to call. Now, there was no cell phones back then, when we were in yeshiva, no cell phones. So it was a lane line, and it can go for over an hour, and nobody picks up. Why? Because everyone is busy with the Gemara. You don't even hear the ring. The ring is in the kitchen. We are in a big hall of the yeshiva. Like we are now in this room, there is a kitchen outside. So the phone is ringing. So only one who goes to make coffee in the kitchen will hear the phone. So if you pick up the phone, you have to be the one who goes to call the guy and make him close the Gemara, which is a very bad thing to make a person stop learning Torah. Because every second is, is a lot of mitzvot. I don't want to be the reason why, because of me, he went to the phone. So nobody wants to pick up the phone. Nobody. Hey, pick up the phone. Why should I pick up the phone? If I pick up the phone, I will have to go call someone. If I have to go call someone, it's bitul Torah, or five, ten minutes. Each minute, how many mitzvot a person does? No, let's see if you remember. How many words a person can say in the average minute? 200 words. Each word is five letters in average. So how many letters per minute? 1,000 letters. Each letter, it's a separate mitzvah from the Torah, just like pulling tefillin on. So each minute of learning is 1,000 mitzvot from the Torah. You call your friend to get up and go to the phone to speak to anyone who is looking for him. Even if the phone call was only five minutes, how many mitzvot he lost? 5,000. Who will be blamed for it? You. So what, what are we going to do? Big problem. Not, no one wants to pick up. That's this poor woman, every hour she used to call, and sometimes she got lucky. Someone that, not from the yeshiva. A visitor or something <laughs> picked up the phone and used to call this guy. The sacrifice this guy had that his wife is constantly crying and complaining, I don't have this, help me with this, give me this, help me with that. She was a very spoiled woman. She cannot be a wife of a Ben Torah. You know, when I went one time to speak for the girls in a seminary in Brooklyn, I asked them, What's your dream? All of them say, to be married to Avrech ben Torah. My dream is that I have a husband that is knowledgeable in Torah, he's learning all day, will be in yeshiva, will have a house of holiness. I say, unbelievable. All of you, minimum Rachel Imenu and Sarah Imenu. Baruch Hashem. But allow me, allow me, to describe to you the life of a woman that her husband is Bachur Yeshiva Avrech. I want to describe to you how your life will look. You ready? Ten minutes I spoke, half of them gave up on the dream. Why? Wow, I didn't know it's so tough. Of course it's tough. What do you think? It's a picnic? And I have five, six kids. Your husband all day, Gemara, Gemara, his head is in the Torah. He's going to have to manage. Kupat Cholim, doctor appointment, this, dentist, that, Parnassa issue, you live in a tiny apartment. Usually that's the way it goes. I mean, your reward is beyond any understanding. One day that you marry to this man, you already make more than a woman who married to a modern Orthodox guy in seven years. A woman that is married to a light religious guy. You know those little leather yamaka, Like the Prime Minister of Israel that he used to glue it with crazy glue to his stupid head. So that, uh, that kind of, uh, of uh, supposedly religious. In seven years he doesn't do what this Avrech does in a day. No exaggeration. Absolutely no exaggeration. In seven years, it doesn't reach the amount of reward that one Avrech in a serious kolel makes in a day. Think about it, it's 600,000 mitzvot in a day. He made 600,000 mitzvot on his life, <laughs> in his dreams. 
Aye, but it's a big sacrifice for it. Not every girl is meant for it. A girl that grew up like prima donna in a $10 million mansion here. All the cleaning lady do the, does everything for her. She didn't, doesn't even pick up her towels from the floor. Why? Cynthia is taking care of business. Or Sylvia. What, what happened to the towels? Don't worry, everything is under control. What did she do in her life? Did she ever cook something? She ever clean something? She did laundry once in her life? She knows how to raise children, to change diapers, to prepare, to go shopping for food, not for Gucci bags. For food in the supermarket, to buy, to clean, to cook, to run, to take care of the kids. She's not uh, equipped for that. I say to parents, the more you spoil your kids, the more you destroy them. Why? This is now you're going to need to take care of them for the rest of their life. Even when they're in their 40s, you're still going to have to feed them. They will never be able to be independent. Why? Because they never did once anything in their life. There's no, uh, nothing is require any responsibility from them. So as long as you give them allowance and free credit card, they'll live the life. They go to restaurant, they'll have the car that daddy gave, they have their own place. But what happened if daddy died? Or business died? What's gonna happen to these people? They'll be mental. The stress will kill them in a, in a month. They'll be dead, brain dead. They won't be able to handle the stress of life. When you raise children with responsibilities, you make them start understanding the value of life, money, responsibility. You can help them, it's no problem. But they can be on their own. If you give your children spoiled lifestyle, you cannot neglect them one day, it's a crime. You are obligated to take care of them for the rest of your life. You don't want to take care of them for the rest of your life? Prepare them from age 10 to take care of themselves. The cleaning lady won't clean the room. They have to clean it. She's not gonna pick up the laundry for them. They have to do it. They're not gonna mess up the shower and everything is all over. From a very young age, you have to raise them to be human beings, not to be animals. And when they go to the supermarket, you have to teach them to check prices. They don't care. American kids, they go with the credit cards of their parents. They take whatever they can. You ask them, how much you paid for it? I have no idea. Not once I found an American guy that cared about the prices. Of course, his parents pay. But in five years he'll be married and he's gonna have a salary of navrech. Maybe his parents will help him a little bit. He's gonna have to live with cheshbon. What do you think? He's gonna go to the supermarket and put a thousand dollars things in the thing for Shabbat? Where is he gonna get the money from? How much the parents can give? They have six, seven kids. They can uh, give two, three thousand to each one. There's a limit to how much they can give. It's not enough for him. He got used to not... You know, my son told me, he was in Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. He said to me, ah, all my friends here are very rich. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, when we go play basketball, they have this expensive court with a fair, I don't know the name of it. It cost, back then it was over a thousand dollars, I think eleven, twelve hundred dollars, that court. He says, so let's see if they forget it in a basketball court, in some gym there in Jerusalem, and they go back to yeshiva, it's ten minutes walk. Oh, I forgot my coat over there. They won't run back to take it. They leave it over there. Why? Daddy would lose 1,200 bucks, big deal. Tomorrow they go and order another one. This is a murder. You already murdered that kid. Doesn't matter if you have a billion dollars. It's not even the money issue. It's the matter of the personality. You created a useless loser that has zero value, cannot do anything on his own, will be dependable for the rest of his life. On the other hand, you have kids that refuse to take money from their parents. Israel used to be very common. When I was a teenager, I knew a few very rich kids, and I said, why are you working as a waiter? Why shouldn't I? Your father is a millionaire. Why can I help you? Yes, he can, but I don't want him to give me money. Wow. I'm 21, I'm 22, I should take care of myself. Student, going to work for a few hours as a waiter. Why? Refuse to take money from his parents. Why? Sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's also bad. 
Why it's bad? Because sometimes it's ego. It's pride. When a poor person refuses to get help from a rich person, usually it's from a negative reason. It's because it's full of, full of himself. It's full of ego. I remember a rich woman who used to give all her children clothing to a poor family. Some of the clothing was much brand new. The children either it wasn't their size, sometimes they had the tag on it. So either your ch the, the poor family will wear it or they can go to the store and exchange it. They still have the, uh, the tag on it. The more she gave, the more the poor woman hated her. Why? I'm a needy. You have easy life. You buy whatever you want. You don't even wear it. The tag is still on it. I feel like I'm nothing. You give me all your leftover. This is a sign of a, of a person that has very bad personality. Someone that is humble doesn't care. I'm poor, so what? Ma? It's a crime to be poor. It's a, it's, it's a shame to be a criminal. It's a shame to be Mechalel Shabbat. It's a shame to be a thief. It's a shame to commit all kinds of other crimes. It's not a shame to be poor. Why is people are so embarrassed to say that they're poor? Why every loser here that has no penny in his pocket, driving a fancy car, doesn't have money for gas? Why is it? It's all a show. Do you know how many times people told me we had to borrow more than $50,000 to make the wedding? Poor people living in apartments here in Rigo Park, tiny apartments. They're not so rich, barely pay their bills. I said, why do you need such a fancy wedding? You, you threw more than $50,000 to the garbage the night of your wedding of food. I'm not talking about the flowers and the two bands and all the show off. Why didn't you take this money and give it to your son and his wife that they should have a year or two of relief that they can start their life until they graduate, they finish, they start making some money. Who cares about that stupid wedding? Anyway, a week later, no one will remember it. You know what they all answer me? All of them. All of them. Same answer. The community will talk. They will say that we are cheap. That we made a simple wedding. We must put the show. We must. Yes. We're going to work for who knows how many years to pay for that wedding. Usually, unfortunately, unfortunately, I hope to be wrong, usually those kids will be divorced before they even finish the debt of that wedding. Imagine paying for a wedding knowing your son or your daughter is already divorced two, three years, still paying for it on your credit card with 25% interest. When you leave against God's rules, your life is pure misery every day. Every day. You don't believe me? Find me any secular person in the world, Jews and non-Jews, regardless how much money they have. It can be billionaires. I'll prove to you in one hour that all of them are extremely miserable. I will prove it to you. How do I know it? Third years I'm doing it. People come to cry to me about the problems. You would think that only the miserable poor people have problems. No, it's the other way around. Poor people don't have so much expectation from their life. They got used to it. The ones who has to constantly put the show, they constantly in the highlight of the eyes of everyone, evil eye, problem, fights, lashonara, jealousy, problems in the family, problems with the children. The children already kill each other in their parents' life for the inheritance. Imagine what it would be when the father died. This has all come from ignorance. No one understands what the life is about. Just money, money, money. Everyone wants this, just to be established. What, what do you live for? I'm saving for the future. Who told you you have a future? What makes you think you'll be alive? No, but I have to save. Ten million dollars. Why? Because I want to set my old, all my children. Who told you the children will be alive? Who told you you will have children? Who told you they will need your help? Who told you the money will be left? There's so many maybes. 
we are basing our life on so many question marks when the urgent things that needs to be dealt with right now is neglected. One person came to Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul Zatzal, the holiest rabbi on earth, 25 years ago, before he passed. He told him, Rabbi, I'm broke. Someone is offering me a job for three days. I will work for three, I'm going to have to leave the yeshiva for three days. I will work with this guy in construction in a job that he got. I will get paid and will be able to learn at least three months with a peace of mind. Three months. I won't have to worry. I will have enough money, shampoo, soap, whatever I need, the shirts, you know, whatever I need to buy. Three months I will have what I need. Rabbi Ben Zion told him for today and tomorrow you have what to live for, you have what you need. He said yes, he said you're not allowed to go. He told him, Rabbi, but why? I'm preparing my future. He said, that's not how a kosher Jew thinks. In the Torah, Hashem gave us manna is falling every day, right? Everyone picked it up and ate in the desert. Forty years we ate bread from heaven. When they used to eat it, they made bracha. Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu melech haolam. They didn't say, Hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Hamotzi lechem min hashamayim. That was the bracha for forty years. And it was unbelievable. It dissolves in your mouth, makes you full, and there is no waste. You don't have to go to the bathroom. Wonderful life. You don't feel heavy, dizzy, you're falling asleep. So there a person needs Shabbat meal. <laughs> I used to have a couch. I already learned my lesson. Next to the long table in the dining room of Shabbat, we used to have a leather couch. <laughs> we used to make fun. How long will it take for all my guests to move to the couch and snow with their mouth open? <laughs> Usually the maximum it took was 10 minutes. Imagine you see four guys like this on the couch. Then I move the couch out of the room. Why, wow, it's embarrassing. There's now some more people in the table. As Soon as they eat a heavy meal, they fall asleep. The man didn't have that. You eat, you enjoy delicious flavor. Hashem said, don't, don't keep for tomorrow. Tomorrow you will have no parnasa. Those who did not listen, let me save. Don't you want to save for the future, Rabbi? Save, saving plans, CDs, CDs, annuities, insurance plans. Hashem say, do not save for tomorrow. Tomorrow I will feed you again. You must trust me. Some people kept it for tomorrow. And what happened? The Torah say, Vayivash, Vayarom tolaim vayivash. Started to smell. Was full of worms. They couldn't enjoy from it. One person, 25 years ago, hid $40,000 in his safe. Israeli guy, another hundred, another hundred, another hundred, you know. It was one pack of 40,000. You know, 25 years, 40,000 was like 140 today. So out of money. With $40,000, there were places you can still buy a house. Today, maybe you buy the bathroom mirror for 40,000. So anyway, one day my accountant is telling me, you want to buy $40,000 for $10,000? I said, what? He said, I have a great opportunity for you. What? One of my clients hid $40,000 in a safe, and it was a very humid place. The humidity made all the money sticks together, and it's one chunk now. You cannot separate it. It's one chunk. So I said to him, so it's worth nothing. <laughs> Why you try to get 10,000 out of me to buy this for? He said to me, no, what do you think I will give you such a bad deal? You have to go to Washington. There is a place, I'm going to tell you where to go. You give it to them. They have special microscopic scale. They have ways to check it. After three months, they will come back to you and tell you that they confirmed that there was that and that money. And then you can go and they give you new money. Did you know that? That guy 
was saving $40,000 in the end, he wants to give ten. Why he doesn't go to Washington? Taxes. Huh? Taxes. Taxes. <laughs> He gets the point. He will go to Washington, they ask him, excuse me, you're a barber, how exactly have $40,000 cash? We don't see it on your tax return. Do you know why they keep changing the $100 bills? Because all the drug dealers and all the people that have tons of cash, they hide it, the cash. Now, if one day they change to a new hundred dollar bill, what are they gonna do? They have 10, 20, 30 million dollars in hundred dollar bills, old bills. They have to now come every day to the bank to cash few thousand. It's gonna take forever. They have to start sending people to different banks. It's a big nightmare. So technically, all the money that the drug dealers put aside become obsolete. Because if one day they show up to the bank, with uh, $10 million in old bills. He said, well, what is this? Oh, money laundering. This was hidden under the ground, huh? That's the reason they don't make bigger bills than $100 for the public. Between banks, they have larger bills. But on the street, maximum $100. When I came to America, with $100 you would eat the entire week in 1989. Today you don't eat for an hour with this. One million, it's more than 100. Meaning the money lost 90% of its value in the last 30 something years. Why don't they make $500 bill? $500 bill, it, was, it would be like a $100 bill 30 years ago. On purpose, they don't want to make it easy for the drug dealers, for all the people that hide cash. They want them to accumulate tons of bills, but it will take them longer and longer to get rid of it. Sometimes people come and say, Rabbi, I, have a, I want to give you a donation. So, okay, here is my Zell. Here is Venmo, here is credit card. What do you want? You can even send a picture of the check, email it to Rabbi Mizrahi. I scan it on my phone. Don't even have to, to mail the check. It became very easy. No, no, I have to meet you in person. I want to give you cash. <laughs> Tov, we give him cash, cash. Said, come to the lecture, we'll meet. Usually those people, they bring old, old bills. From the boy, <laughs> from the boy, you know, it's hidden probably 40, you smell it over there, over there, you smell the mold. It was hidden under the ground for 30 years. Old bills, they're afraid to take it to the bank. So what do they do? They spread it. They pay a little in a gas station here, there, in a supermarket. They give donations. Why? That's the only way to get out of the money. They can't come to the bank with all the money they hid. This is the, <laughs> this is what's behind it. So Rabotai, everyone save and save and save, and in the end what happened? Comes Bernie Madoff and wipe them all out. There are people who save 30 years, walk like dogs, and come Bernie Madoff one day on the news. Bernard Madoff was arrested for $60 billion scam. People invested all their life saving by him. Only universities, invested more than $100 million each by him. Some of this fake university lost more than $100 million and he did not even tickle them. Do you know how you lose a quarter? Your wife said to you, let's go look for it. Would you out of your mind? <laughs> Waste time to look for a quarter? Kaparat Avonot, Baruch Hashem, it's only a quarter. If you find a person who drives back to the place to look for a quarter, you know he's mentally sick. The gas would cost more. You know these people who drive to Costco with a coupon to buy two things, two items, twenty dollars, and the gas cost them probably fifteen. Yeah, the parking. No, Costco don't charge for parking yet. Don't give them ideas. <laughs> so maybe in Queens they do. I don't know. And by us they don't. <laughs> anyway, so you know. What is, the, what, is the, what is the point? The point is trying to save, you, you, you lose a dollar, you save a penny. <sighs> Going back, Rabotai, Mamash, before we finish. From all the people that Hashem created in the world, He waited on purpose to create Adam in the end. 
after everything was created. Why? Why wasn't created on the third day? When they continue to create animals after. One day there was no animals, big deal, two days. Adam could be created on the first day and everything else later. It's not the end of the world. Why does he have to be created in the last minute, in the last day? The answer is because he is including in him all the other three categories. So first you have to create all the animals, then you have to create all the plants and the trees, and you have to create all the raw material in a creation, and that's when you can create Adam. Because in him you have raw material, growing aspect, living creature, and a divine soul. Everyone was created according to his spiritual level, raw material, first. After that, plants, second. After that, animals, third. After that, human being, fourth. Because he includes in him the other three. So you don't go, when you, when you dress in the morning, you first put a t-shirt. On top of it, you put tzitzit. On top of it, you put a dress shirt, and on top of it, you put the jacket. You don't put the jacket, and on the jacket, you put the tzitzit, and on top of it, you put the, 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 the t-shirt. The jacket first? No. You have order. First t-shirt, then tzitzit, then dress shirt, then a jacket. Same thing over here. First raw material, then plants, then animals, and then people. So Rabotai, one last thing, a leaf has come, he cleaned Yaakov out of all his wealth. Yaakov had a debate. Should I go to yeshiva now or no? Why? Rambam say, a person should first learn Torah while he's single, he has a peace of mind, no distraction, and then get married. But there is an exception to the rule. If he's a person that has big Yetzirah for women, the Yetzirah is boiling inside him, age 16, 17, he's already, wow, I need a woman, I need a woman, I can function. Someone like this needs to get married young. The woman will save him from all the thoughts and the things and the all kinds of things that the Yetzirah brings him. The Gemara say, one of the things that the wife does to a person, save him from the evil inclination. But if a person that is holy, doesn't have uh, all kinds of imaginations, is fully in the Torah, the Torah kills the Yetzirah for the time being, what's the rush? You get married, 21, 22, 23, this is how most of the Bachurei Shivot today. Hasidim is a little bit different. They want to marry them fast. 18, 19, that's the ages usually by them. By Litvish, Sfaradim, by Alei Tshuva, it's 20 to 23. That's the ages of the boys. Anyway, Rabotai, now there is an argument, what should you do? Some say you should first get married and then learn Torah. The Rambam and others say, no, you should first learn Torah and get married later. Yaakov Avinu, how did he think? When he was on the way to, to Lavan, he first wanted to get married, right? And then go and learn Torah, to be an Avrech. But once Eliphaz cleaned him from all his money, he has no money, so okay, you know what? If that's the case, I should first go to, the, to Yeshiva, Learn Torah and then get married. Why? Because the Rambam say a person should learn Torah and after that he will go and, and build a home. It wasn't like today, you need millions of dollars to build a home. It was a cabin with some wood and all of that. And that's basically, you know, within a few months you already can build yourself a home. Today, unfortunately, the way the world became, in Israel, for instance, doesn't matter what you're going to do. Age 50, you cannot afford to buy yourself a house. The prices of real estate is so expensive. People make very small salaries. Cost of living is the most expensive in the world. Israel is the number one country in the world in expensive prices. Officially, it came number one. A few months ago when I was in Israel, they showed the chart. 
more expensive than Switzerland, than the United States, than Europe, than any country in the world. And the sad problem is that here, it's also expensive, New York, but the salary here is three or four times more than what they make in Israel. Even here, if a person makes $4,000 a month, it's considered poor. It's impossible to raise a family with $1,000 a week. Not enough. The rent alone is like three, four thousand. That's m most of the of the rent. Everything almost go to the rent. He needs food stamps. He needs help. He needs all kinds of help. But the wife has to work. If someone makes four thousand dollars in Israel, it's like sixteen, fifteen thousand shekel. It's considered above average. You are, and it's don't think that it's enough. It's not enough. Everyone is a negative, balanced, maneuvering just to survive. But most people, you know how much they make? What's the average salary in Israel? 6,000 shekel, $1,500 a month. Average salary from morning to night work, six days a week. And the prices are like New York. Food like New York, real estate became like New York. Cars double the New York or more. If it's a luxury car, it's three times more. What you pay 100,000 for BMW, it's 300,000 in Israel. You buy a little Toyota, it's double on the price. Average cars. But fancy cars, they kill you on the taxes. Everything is so expensive. Gas, three times more than here. Three times more. Food, same prices. Go to the supermarket, the cheese, the Israeli cheese you buy here, same price in the supermarket in Israel. I don't know how they do it because they have to ship it with an airplane. <coughs> airplane costs a lot of money to fill it up with products. But in the end, sometimes it's here, it's cheaper than there. I don't know how they do it. I have no idea. But life is very expensive and the income is not so big and the taxes are the highest in the world, close to 50%. If you make a nice living, if you're very poor, they give you a small tax. <laughs> they know there's not enough to eat. But by the way, that's one of the signs that the Gemara gave before Mashiach, that the inflation will be extremely terrible. Everything will keep going higher and higher and higher. Do you know the price of tefillin and mezuzot is more than double than before Corona? Very, very fast. Once Corona started and many thousands of people died, tefillin, that used to be a thousand, right away went up to two. Mezuzot used to be $60, went up to $150 now. Everything became double. The value of money, there's no value. Everything is so expensive. And the salaries, some people here in America, they make almost the same like they made 10 years ago. Maybe 10% more. The cost of living became three times more. The middle class was wiped out. People with high college degrees, Master degrees, 10 years of experience in uh, academic jobs. They can make a living. One dentist told me I, I can't pay for yeshivot. I said, how much you make? They say 90,000 a year. It's, if I'm going to start paying for three, four yeshivot, I won't have what to eat. Is it working for someone's office, dentist. 90,000 a year, he went to dental school. You know how difficult it is? college and dental school and this, and in the end he cannot pay for his children's school. Why? The middle class is wiped out, unfortunately. But that was predicted in the Gemara. Now before the end, that's what's going to happen. Everything will be extremely expensive. People will be broke. The pockets will be empty. Most people are stuck. You, you know how many request I get every day from people in Israel for financial help. You have no idea what's going on. Every three minutes, someone asks, I can pay, I have to move. I cannot afford my rent, but I cannot pay the movers. I have two days to move. I cannot, I cannot pay the moving. I don't know what to do. People are crying, literally crying. They don't have money. Now with the war, people that own stores for more than a month, they were closed or many of them in a reserve fighting in Gaza when their business is dying. There are major consequences to our crimes against Hashem. 
What does not come through the head, come through the legs, remember this. מה שלא בא דרך הראש, בא דרך הרגליים. You don't want to learn the easy way, I will teach you the hard way, the Torah says. If you're going to follow my instructions and my advice and my restrictions, I'm going to bless you with all the blessing. And if you rebel against me, you ignore my Shabbat, you ignore my covenant with you, you ignore the Torah. A list of problems are yet to come. We are now experiencing all these curses. We are in the middle of it. The enemy among you will rise and you will sink. You will have no security. Your borders will be insecure. One enemy will run hundreds of you. You live in panic. You'll be petrified. You'll be lonely. The whole world will hate you. Look what's happening. You won't be secure anywhere. All of this written in the Torah. People think it's nature. That's the way it should be. What can we do? We have no control. Wrong. We are the reason that it became like that. If all Jews were Shomer Shabbat, eating kosher, believing in God, thanking Him, eating bread, saying Birkat Amazon, women would dress with classy modesty and dignity. No one would, would behave like animals. We are not animals. We have to control our desires. Yes, we're not perfect also. We can fall. But we have to rise right back, apologize, repent, and move on. Can't let ourselves become animals. Look what's happening out there. Look how much rage, look how much anger, look how much murder, look how much hatred. Look how many thieves, look how many robberies. Today they sent me another video of mobs breaking into some Nike store. Cleaning up the whole store in minutes. Every one of them grab sneakers, t-shirts. Much worse than animals in a safari. The world became worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to remind you, Hashem wiped out all the wicked people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He burned them all alive. They all got burned. Because they behave not as bad as people behave today. Not as bad. Today people are worse, I promise you. I know what happened then and I know what's happening now. I see it out. We're already paying. But even when Hashem punishes us, it's with a lot of mercy. 3,000 terrorists with machine guns, grenades, RPGs, hundreds of cars, pickups, full of terrorists. Do you know what it means? 3,000 murderers, Nazis with no heart running around and see thousands of people and in the end only 1,200 died. Could have been 50,000. Each, each one of them could have killed hundreds. Ta -ta 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 -ta, machine guns, grenades. If you really think about it, each one of the terrorists killed a third of a person. Think about it. You go to a place with 3,000 people. Anywhere you shoot, someone will die. You don't even have to aim. Da -da 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 -da. Hundreds of people are dying. 3,000 surrounded that party. All together with the villages, with the kibbutzim, with the soldiers, with the police. 1,200 dead. That means 3,000 terrorists, each one of them approximate, each three of them kill one Jew. Three Arabs with machine guns, with tons of civilians around, each three kill one. Don't you see the miracle? Do you understand that everyone could have killed 50 easy? Then what would we do? We would have 50,000 dead. The Israeli leaders, they constantly give false hopes to people. We will wipe out the Hamas. Beloni you cannot wipe out the Hamas. Enough with this nonsense. There are 40,000 terrorists and another half a million waiting online to join. You killed 5,000 terrorists until now, you have 50,000 ready right away to take weapons and come and fight you. You're gonna kill all 40,000, Iran will send them another 400,000. Who do you think the Hezbollah are? Have thousands of terrorists getting paid, have tons of money. Kerdesi of Hussein Obama, he 
released all the frozen money of Iran, more than 100 billion dollars, and from that moment, the terrorism became a hundred times worse. He, he, Hussein Obama helped his brothers in Iran. And once they got all the money, all they invested it is in killing Jews. They don't care that Iranian people starving, they have no medication, no clothes to wear, they don't care. Same thing in Gaza. Let two million Arabs die, they can care less. They have only one purpose, to torture Jews. Because it's written in the Torah that Hashem said, if we don't keep Shabbat, that's what will happen to us. If we don't follow the Torah, this is what he's going to do to us with his cruel enemies. If it was not written, I would not dare to say. It would be a crime to say. It would be chutzpah to say. But if it's written in the book of God, it's a crime not to say. If you know what I mean. If it's my own opinion, oh, you're crazy, you fanatic, you're scary, you make up things. Yes, you're right. <laughs> if it's written black and white, I'm a criminal if I won't say it. Anyone who did not say it until now in the last two months, he is violating the obligations of the Torah. Because Hashem wants the leaders to tell the communities why these things are happening to us. The Rambam said we have to blow the trumpets 800 years ago. Why? There is a tragedy in a community. Today we make sirens. There was no sirens 800 years ago. Blow the trumpets that everyone will know to cry and to read Tehillim. There's a tragedy. Everyone will repent. Everyone will ask Hashem for forgiveness. Immediately he can turn everything to the positive side. Let's just finish with this and we're done for today. The rest I continue tomorrow in Brooklyn. Yaakov realized that now when I have nothing left, I might as well go and learn Torah. Then he went to Lavan. He got married. After seven years he worked. Yaakov suggested to work for Rachel for seven years. Why? Wait for him. Wait for him to tell you how much he wants you to work. Maybe Lavan wouldn't ask for seven years. Maybe Lavan said, work three years and I'll give you my daughter. Quickly, Yaakov says seven. Why? When you love a woman, and there's no guarantee her father will give her to you. If you offer too little, he may get so disgusted by you and make you fly away. Move out of here. We don't want to hear your offer. It's like buying a house. You have a beautiful home, see, here, right here in Jamaica, mistake. And let's say worth three million dollars, you invested a million dollars, renovated it, made it the palace. Even the two lions you didn't forget. You put it in the front. So you have a nice palace here. Now someone come to you, some Israeli businessman from real estate. Ah, you want to sell your house? Yes. Don't you see, I put a sign for sale. I'll give you 1.5. <laughs> the land costs more than 1.5. What do you mean 1.5? It's minimum three. Come on, don't be greedy. We bought Jews. Leave me some room to make money. Leave you some room, huh? <laughs> After that, you don't want to ever see his lousy face, right? Okay, listen, let's make it 1.8. I don't want to hear from you. Don't call me. Come on. Two million. No, 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 don't, don't call me. All right, 2.5. Oh, now it's starting to get to the right value. But you, you already discussed it from him. You don't even answer him. If you see calls, you don't answer. Why? Because the first offer was 1.5. If it would start with 2 point something, okay, we can get to what it's really worth. Same thing with Yaakov. It's too much to risk. If Yaakov would say, I will work for you for two, three years. Oh yeah, that's all she worked for you? Two, three years? Move back to your family. We don't need you here. Right away, Yaakov, out of fear to lose Rachel, I will work for you for seven years. The crook, so where is this genius came from? <laughs> Eight years, no problem. Eight, seven years, no problem. 
The question is that I have and we finish here. Please answer me. It's written that it was only, it looked like few days for Yaakov. When you love a woman and you have to work seven years until you're able to marry her. Remember, you're not chilonim that you can make sins. You cannot put your finger on hers until she become your wife. So seven years, the woman you love so much and the one her so badly, you walk like a slave, take care of the sheep, and she's coming and going, and she serves food by your family. And you say, wow, I have another six and a half years. Wow, it will never end. It's a nightmare. People today get engaged. When is the wedding? We couldn't find a all. It's going to be January. I'm dying. What happened? Three months. Wow, I'm dying. I don't know how we'll survive. Three months. So I don't get it. Now he has to suffer seven years. The Torah says, It looked like a week, not seven years. It should have been the other way around. You wait seven years for the woman you love, it looked like seven years, right? When you're looking for something you desire, the more you wait, I mean, it looks forever. So what does it mean, Vayu be'enav ki'amim achadim? written in a book of God. Shem testified that it looked like a few days for him. The answer, of course it looked forever. Of course he was already anxious, when can I marry her? Of course. What does it mean he was, it's like a few days? The seven years that I offered as my price for your daughter, it's such a bargain that for me, it looked like I worked a week only. I got it easy. I should have worked seven years for her. She does, she's worked the whole world. What seven years? Such a beautiful, righteous, holy, the mother of the children of Israel come from her. So what is seven years? Someone said, you come on, work one year for me. What for? For my Rolls Royce, 600,000. Oh, really? Wow, dear, such a bargain. 600, not bad. Walk one year for me. Why? For little Toyota. Find somebody else, different fool. For that one year, it's $20,000 car. Wow. Ah, for the Rolls Royce or the Ferrari, he doesn't mind to walk a year. Why? It's a bargain. Same thing here. Once he gave him Leah, he said to him, the crook, work seven more years for Rachel. First time I learned it in my life, I almost fainted. I felt so bad for Yaakov until one person in yeshiva told me, no, don't worry. He got Leah a week later, uh, Rachel, a week later. Once the Sheva Brachot of Leah finished, immediately he married Rachel. He worked seven years for her, but he got the product up front this time. Before, he had to finish the payment and then get it. Now he already said, oh, don't worry. I tricked you, but I'll give you Rachel in a week. But I worked seven years, and then six more years. And then when he left with a lot of sheep, the sons of Lavan say, Yaakov stole everything from our father. <laughs> You can see classic anti-Semitism. Yaakov worked 20 years like a slave, faithfully for him, did not touch one thing ever without permission. It's written in the Torah, I work day and night for you. I'd never been late. I was so devoted. I never tricked you. I never disrespected you. And now you come and chase me like I'm some kind of a thief? That's Rabotai anti-Semitism in the Torah, with Abraham, with Yitzchak, and with Yaakov. Abraham and Yitzchak, they blocked the wells they dug. You're too rich, you Jew. You're too rich. They say to him, to Yitzchak, move, move out of here. You have monopoly here. Everything you touch become gold. Why don't you leave? What happened in the end? They begged him to come back. Jews left Uzbekistan, I don't know all these places. One person told me, the president said, please come back. We lost all the blessings since you left. We're willing to give you help with buying a house here. It's too late, they move here to America, or they're gonna go back to those countries. 
Every place the Jewish people live, the place is getting God's blessing. When the Jews were in Russia, USSR was a major empire. Lots of wealth, controlling more than 12 countries. The Jews ran away from Russia. Psh, Russia collapsed, became a very poor people there are struggling. That's it. No more USSR. Jews were in Iran in the time of the Shah. Iran was the fourth country in the world in wealth. Better than Paris. Romani came, the Jews ran away from Iran. Iran went back a thousand times in time. All the blessing of the place disappeared. The Jews were in Spain and Portugal. They were the empires of the world 500 years ago. They started to kill the Jews, the Spanish Inquisition. They kicked them out of the land. The Jews ran away to Iran, to other countries. What happened to Spain and Portugal? Nobody knows who they are. Tiny countries are broke, completely bankrupt. Full of Arabs, that's it, it's over. Their story is over. Jews were in Germany, the strongest country in the world. Comes Hitler, Imam Shimo and his friends, killing millions of Jews and the rest ran away. Germany became a tiny country, that's it. It's nothing special. Every country where the Jews live, they bring their blessing to the place. Why? They are the children of God. Some Americans understand it. That's why there's so much pro-Jews. The problem is when the United States becoming full of Arabs and full of Muslim terrorists and so many anti-Semite Americans, it became an impossible place to live. So soon or later, another five years, another ten years, I don't know exactly how much, but Jews will have to run away from here. Already Jews are running away from here. They realize it. Some Jews buy weapons, some Jews choose to leave. Is Israel safer from here? Probably not. But if I have to live in a risk, I might as well live in a holy land. In a risk. At least I have a mitzvah to walk in Eretz Israel. Once the Jews would leave America, I promise you this. I promise you this, without a doubt. This place will become the worst place on earth. People will eat each other alive for food here. People will kill each other in a parking lot of supermarket for bread. That's what's going to happen here. Just like it happened in Russia and in other places. Every place that kicked the Jewish people, the blessing of the place is gone. Like the Spanish reporter wrote, we had a nation that contributed to us unlimited contributions, the Jews. In economy, in finance, in art, in literature, in science, in medicine. Nobody ever helped Europe more than the Jews until with our stupidity we killed them all and God punished us and gave us these low-life Arabs that came to Europe and destroyed us and does not contribute anything to us besides devastation and destruction. Spanish goy. We, we're getting what we, we, are, we deserve to get. And now it's too late. Almost all the Jews ran away from Europe or died. Now they are feeling the mistakes they made. Instead of Jews, they got millions of Arabs who all day make riots, burning cars, taking all the money from the government for the children they have, and occupying another street and another street and making the Europeans life hell on earth. That's why in Holland now they have a very anti-Muslim new president. Same thing in Argentina. Soon all Europe's will have Nazi presidents in their ideology. It's too late though. They missed the train. No one can do anything to the Muslims already. There are tens of millions of them in Europe. And they grow non-stop when the Europeans are dying out. There is nothing they can do. It's too late. They should have done it 20 years ago. If they wanted to stop the occupation of Muslims, they occupy Europe. Now it's too late because the Muslims are not Jews. They're not standing on line to go into the gas chambers, not making a beep. When you tell the Muslim you cannot do this or you cannot do that or you cannot go to the mosque or you cannot wear this clothes or you cannot open new uh, congregations or stuff like that, you know what would happen? Millions of them will burn you alive on the streets. Gunshot, grenades, bombs, burning cars. No one will dare to come out of their house. 
It's not Israelis or the worry about not killing some Palestinian kid. That's why Israeli soldiers are dying every day, because they're afraid maybe civilians will get hurt. And in the end, everyone called the Israeli criminal, war criminals. I said, I don't get it. If I do everything I can just to go after terrorists who murder my children, and I do everything I can not to hurt anyone else, and they bring them and cover themselves behind them, use them as shield, and in the end some of them are die as collateral damage, and you are calling me a war criminal, what incentive I have to continue to try not to hurt civilians? If anyway, you are claiming that I'm coming to help to kill civilians. What's, what's the point? If anyway everyone bad mouthing you, just finish the job already. Get all these terrorists and do what you can. Now that it's possible, don't get me wrong, we are 100% in the end of Hashem. We can earn another year or two of relatively quiet. That's it. They're going to rebuild their organization. We've been with them many, many rounds. They constantly, quickly, within a year or two, they'll build everything just as big as it was before. They have money, Iran, Turkey, all these countries, Qatar, they give them tons of money. The interest of the world that they will torture us. Nobody wants to accept them to their country. No Palestinians are welcome in any country. Egypt does not let them in, Jordan, Qatar, nobody, Turkey, no one let them in. Keep them in Gaza that they should continue to hurt the Jews. Why they don't let them in? They know what's going to be. They know what's going to be. In Jordan, they made problems. King Hussein shot at them with tanks. Tanks killed 10,000 of them. Boom, tanks on the street. Tanks shooting at civilians. Palestine. Since 1970 until today, 54 years, they did not make one tiny bit. After Hussein shot at them on the streets. They care what the world says. The Arabs. Who cares? In Egypt, they care what they say. They know not to mess with them. With us, they know our hands are cuffed. Why? Because Hashem did it. Hashem showed us the Israelis, as great as the army is, it's worthless. Politician doesn't let the army do what needs to be done. So what good is a good army? If you put handcuffs on their hands, there's nothing they can do. Politicians are afraid. Why? They have no God-fearing. No, God, no fear from God. The worry of Joe Biden, or what the European may say, or United Nations. The worry. They're afraid. Why are they afraid? Why are they afraid? Because the world can put sanctions now. Sanctions against Israel. Israel is a tiny country. It cannot handle sanctions. So they always worry if they're going to pass sanctions like they did in Iran and Russia. Do you know what it means? You won't be able to park your boat anywhere as Israeli. You won't be able to go through certain paths in the ocean. You won't be able to sell merchandise in some places. You won't be able to do banking. They can even disconnect you from the SWIFT. You won't be able to do wire from Israel or to receive wire. It can be a disaster. Hashem did it in such a way that no matter how great we will be, we are worthless. Our government is worthless, the army is worthless, the help we have from America, it's basically worthless. We have only one solution. Hashem, we are in your hand. There's no one else we can count on. This is exactly what Hashem wants. This is exactly what the Gemara say in Masechet Sota. Ve'en lanu al mi lismoch. And we have no one to count on the end of days besides our Father in heaven. But the good news is there will be a very sweet, happy end to all of this. It may take a few decades. It may take years. It may take tens of years. But it will happen. There will be a day that Hashem will send the Mashiach and he will do judgment to all these anti-Semite nations who tortured us for more than 2,000 years. It's a promise. It's a promise in the Tanakh by all the prophets. 
It's also a promise in the Talmud. It's a promise in the Zohar. The Torah never lied before. No reason to believe that the Torah lies now. Everything happened when the Torah promised. It's a very good prophecy. The question is, are we going to have the merit to survive, to see it or not? If we will be Mechalele Shabbat, we, will, we can dream. We will never make it. If we be thieves and speak Lashon Hara all day, and never learn Torah, and don't come to shul, and women will dress not modest and commit all kinds of other sins, we're lowering our chances. So now it's the time to wake up. Now, now. If not now, when? When? It may be too late next month. I don't know what happened now with the cyber attack. I hope it's nothing major. Has for Shalom, if it boiled down the whole system. Do you know what it means that you have cyber? I have two, my website is two weeks under attack. I mean, I mean, we got rid of the attack. But we do not want to bring it back up until we check every file manually to make sure there's nothing. Hopefully today or tomorrow we'll be able to finish it. My team is working on it for already more than two weeks. Baruch Hashem, we had a replacement website. Look how Hashem prepared the website to be on standby that we are able to have a website that people can continue to watch some lectures and people can continue to donate and you know there's, there's a donation page. So you don't feel as much the absence of the original divine information. It, turn, it sends you automatically to rabbimizrahi.org, which is a beautiful website. But it doesn't have 10,000 uh, lectures there. You know, we didn't feel 10,000. It takes a long time to put so many lectures of so many years. But many times Hashem makdim trufa la makad. This is what we say in Baruch Shama. Baruch gozer umkayem. Hashem makes a decree, but he already gave you the ability to overcome the decree in advance. You have a disease, but the medicine is already in town few days earlier. You have a disease and a doctor is on the way to your country. Why? Because Hashem knew he's bringing you that disease in a week. So already arrange the solution to your problem. That's called Baruch Gozerum Kayem. You have to open up your eyes and see the supervision of Hashem. The Muslims attack the website. Why they attack me? Because I became a star now in the Muslim uh, pages. Hundreds of thousands of views. All the Arabs cursing me, Baruch Hashem, all over the world, which is a great blessing. Of course, they do the same thing the lefty Jews here do. They take things out of context. They cut different parts of my lecture and they put misleading headlines. Like, for instance, when I spoke about that the entire world is idol worshippers, and to be an idol worshipper, it's death penalty for Jews and for Gentiles. And I actually say that, that Arabs are not idol worshippers. They believe in one God, but they have different problems, that they love to murder or to support murder, or they dance when innocent civilians are being butchered. Either way, it's against the seven law of Noah. That part they didn't put in the video. They just put a headline, nobody deserves to live, according to this rabbi, you know? But the good news is that now all the goyim who watch these clips for the first time in their life, they're finding out that they are idol worshippers. Christians didn't know they are idol worshippers. Buddhists, Hindus, they didn't know. Now it's in Pakistan, it's in India, it's in all the Arab countries. So what do you think happened? The hackers, they want to attack the website. If the enemies of the Jewish people love a rabbi, you know exactly what to say. If they love you, oh, we love that rabbi. Oh, the Nazi love a rabbi? Something is very fishy here. Hamas love a rabbi? <laughs> Check what a lefty liberal this rabbi is. What a traitor he may be. Oh, they love the reform people, of course. They fight for them all day. It didn't stop them from murdering them. But the idea is, Rabotai, when the wicked people love you, that's a very bad sign. When the righteous people love you, it's a good sign. But people who hate God, and they love you, that means you yourself are not on God's side. It's very easy, it's simple math. 
Someone who loves God loves the, the rabbis that speak the truth of God. Someone that hates God loves the rabbis that change and modify the Torah and present it in a fake way. Why? Well, he's doing the job for us. Like that one who say, let me marry Isaac and John. Two men is married in a synagogue. Men and men. I'm a Kohen, let me give you Berkat Kohanim. Yevarech Echa Hashem Vishmerecha. Two gays. Big crime against God in the Torah. And a reform one say, God will bless you. What bless you? According to the Torah, they have no share to the world to come. What exactly the blessing is going to help them? What blessing they're going to get when they violate one of the biggest sins in the Torah against God? It's a death penalty, it's no joke. Death penalty in the Torah. So you have fakers pretend to be rabbis and they don't keep any laws and they also make other people go against God. Our job is not to be fooled by them. We have to stick to the kosher ones. I once told you, if you don't know who to follow, always follow Rav Avigdor Miller Zatzal. Buy all his books. It's enough material for 40 years to read. Every one of his books is a treasure. Just learn it. It's great Ashkafa, great Jewish ideology. Every answer is precise. There's no kissing up to the wicked, no kissing up, no politics, no fakeness. Everything so brave, cut to the chest. Nothing is their politics. 100% pure divine answers. Very hard to find. Because remember, even big leaders, they are under a lot of pressure. They have congregation, people, Mechalele Shabbat, they have gays in their community, they have intermarriage in their community, they have rich people, that generous, they give donation, but they commit every crime against Hashem besides the donation. They have to maneuver between all the people. Rav Avigdor Miller was 100% truth. That's why many people couldn't stay in the shul. They left to other shuls. He used to joke about it. Every time I give a speech, half of the people get up and leave. Instead of staying and dealing with the truth, they run away. My advice to you, don't run away. Stay with the truth. Try to improve yourself. You know it's the truth. Nobody's selling you here any fakeness. The truth, sometimes it's hard to keep. But those who will fulfill it, will be the luckiest for eternity. Thank you very much. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen, Amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer Atsa, Kedosh Bachu, Lezakot, Yisrael. Nefichach, Herba, Lahem, Torah, Mitzvot. Shanem.